Hey there. How are you doing? Good. Are we ready? Welcome to the March 3rd Boulder City Council meeting. Um, Lynette, could you call the roll? Councilmember Brockett. Present. Friend. Here. Joseph. Here. Nagel. Here. Swetlick. Here. Wallach. Here. Weaver. Here. Yates. Here. Young. She's here. She's here. We have a quorum, Mayor. Kitchen. Okay, so open comment is closed as usual at 6 p.m. Um, tonight we have two public hearings. There's a second reading of Ordinance 8381 or 8384 regarding the Marijuana Licensing Authority name. And then there will be an update on state legislation and consideration of a motion to revise the City of Boulder's regional, state, and federal policy agenda. Those are the two public hearings. Um, 2020 Board and commissions annual recruitment applications have closed. However, there are four boards for which we are still accepting applications. Please, please sign up if you're interested in, in working and contributing to city decision making. There's Boulder Junction Access District Parking. There's the Design Advisory Board. So if you're interested in architecture, that's a fun one. Downtown Management Commission focuses on downtown and the um, conditions there. And then Landmarks Board um, is a big one, which um, designates landmarks in the city of Boulder. Uh, the general requirements are that you've resided for one year within the city limits of Boulder, you're 18 years or older, and then certain other seats have different applications on different board, or sorry, not different applications, different requirements for certain seats on boards. So the information is available at bouldercolorado.gov slash boards dash commissions. And just as a heads up, there's no meetings scheduled for next Tuesday, March 10th. And then we amended the agenda to add a few items. Um, we added a coronavirus update that we will have here shortly. And then we have follow-up on the CU South study session that we had last week. You need a motion? So, yes, we need a motion. So moved. And before, before we go, I'm just going to switch the order. We're going to do the declaration for the census last um, before open comment so that we can get the coronavirus update and send that person along to the Longmont City Council meeting. I move the uh, amendments to the agenda. Second. All in favor? Great. Well, we will begin tonight then with a, a wonderful recognition. So just right here. Um, so I'm really excited to be here this evening. Let me introduce myself. My name is Trish Stiles. I am the town administrator for the town of Bennett, uh, but I also get the pleasure of serving as the 2020 CCCMA uh, president. So I'm here tonight to present to you our 2020 city manager of the year. I have to say, sometimes when you meet good people, you just know they're good. And Jane is one of these people. In fact, I think she's not just good, I think she's great. Um, not only does Jane lead the city of Boulder while modeling exponential public leadership, but she also does that for Colorado and beyond. She represents Colorado local government on a national stage as the ICMA president to help our profession thrive into the future. She truly believes and demonstrates that there are all leaders of, at all levels of local government. By actively encouraging others to explore training and development and personally serves as a resource for those seeking to grow in the profession. In fact, she has specifically stated that it is her responsibility to ensure, ensure that there are more women in leadership positions in the future and specifically the title of city manager. Did you know that nationwide less than 20% of women serve as city managers? Jane is a champion from equity, inclusion, and diversity and views this as a moral imperative of the profession for our communities. Jane's leadership is one of the reasons that we will see more women serve as city managers and help make that number change. 
In October, Jane was also named as a finalist for the women, uh, the League in, of Women in Government's Trailblazer Award. The reason for her selection included Jane Says Yes and encourages women in Boulder and throughout the profession to step forward and seize opportunities to contribute to the profession and grow their careers. Jane has directly influenced many women in the profession to advance from assistant to the city manager to a role as either a deputy city manager or a city manager. She invests her personal time to guide women in their career path. And more specifically, she continues to ensure the success of women in these roles and makes herself available to provide perspective and advice when needed. Jane's leadership has also had an impact on some of the most pressing issues of our time. In the past year alone, the city of Boulder has made significant progress under her leadership, including racial equity, climate change, homelessness, police community trust and relations, and affordable housing. Her ability to dive into addressing Boulder's adaptive challenges while balancing the diverse voices of the city council and the community is exemplary. The progress Boulder has made in these areas, along with the commitment to serve, to continuing to serve and exceed community expectations, makes Jane's work as a city manager a model everywhere. Jane has shaped our region for the better. As city manager, she demonstrates humility, authenticity, integrity, and compassion, even in the midst of challenges confronting our communities. <clears throat> It is my great honor to present to you Jane Brodigan, the first woman to receive the CCCMA City Manager of the Year Award. I'd also add that we have our executive director, Denise Taylor, with us, as well as, where did Heather go? <laughs> Heather's right here behind me as well, Heather Balser, so. All of us, yep. <laughs> So just so you know, Heather Balzer is the city manager of the city of Louisville and has been a longtime colleague and friend of mine. So I'm super glad that she's here. Um, the thing that I want to say is that it's so gratifying to get an award from your colleagues in the profession. It really means a lot. Um, and when they read all the things that supposedly I did, especially here in Boulder, I just want to say that really it's my colleagues in our organization and the city council that have made these things true. And I feel so gratified to be able to accept an award, um, getting credit for stuff that other people really um, helped make, make true. So thank you very much for allowing us to do this this evening. It means quite a bit to me. Um, I've had a very long career, almost 45 years in public service, and it's been amazing. So thank you. Congratulations, Jane, <clears throat> and I think I speak for all of council when I say we are we are very lucky to have somebody as hardworking and as uh, successful as you are at what you do. So thank you very much. Thank you, Mayor. Okay, next up we have an update on the coronavirus response that we can expect from the County of Boulder. Thank you for being here. Thank you for having us, and congratulations. Thanks. Um, this is four weeks. We'll get your presentations okay. right up there. Perfect, thank you. Um, tough agenda item to follow, but yeah, congratulations from all of us. I'm Carol Helwig, I'm Communicable Disease Epidemiologist at Boulder County Public Health. I'm here along with our Agency Director, Jeff Sayak, our Emergency Manager from Public Health, Lisa Whittakind, and the Emergency Manager for Boulder County and City of Boulder, Mike Chard. Um, we are gonna share this update with you about the coronavirus situation. Um, so right now, coronavirus it has been detected in 77 countries and territories around the globe. This is nine additional locations than just 24 hours ago. Um, in the last 24 hours, there were almost nine times more cases reported outside of China than inside of China. The epidemic in the Republic of Korea, Italy, Iran, and Japan, and Japan are of great concern. 
And of course, our greatest concern now is that there is community spread occurring in the United States. Um, So the United States COVID-19 case counts as of March 3rd um, include 12 states with confirmed and presumptive positive cases. Uh, the, the official CDC case count from earlier today was 60 with 11 confirmed person-to-person -person spread, 27 under investigation, um, and so far six uh, confirmed deaths earlier today. We do have the reported instances where community spread is, is occurring, as particularly in Washington state, where they have had multiple people with no known travel exposures, and health workers have been impacted, and there is a potential uh, outbreak identified in a long-term care facility. This situation is, is really evolving very rapidly, and we are paying attention to all the details as they become available. So far, this is um, the case. The case count in Colorado is zero. The case count in Boulder County is zero. Uh, in Colorado, since earlier today, there have been a total of 37 people under investigation. This means that they may have traveled to one of the impacted areas and um, needed testing to make sure that they were not exposed to the virus. Of those, 29 of the cases were found to be negative, and eight are pending. Um, in Boulder, we have monitored travelers. Uh, we've monitored 32 travelers um, total, and currently we only have four being monitored. The rest have already completed their monitoring period. And we have had four people under <coughs> investigation, all of them negative. Um, I just wanted to do two minutes of quick steps that people can take now to prevent um, the, the virus. Getting a flu shot is not going to prevent COVID, but if you haven't had a flu shot, getting a flu shot will prevent you from potentially getting the flu. And we really want to reduce the impact of respiratory illness in our healthcare systems right now. So we are recommending that everyone get their flu shot. We're recommending everyone stay home when you're sick, cover your coughs and sneezes with a tissue and throw it in the trash or wash your hands often. Um, and make sure to step up your cleaning of frequently touched surfaces, doorknobs and things like that. We also have recommendations for employers. We recommend that all employers recommend that their staff get a flu shot, they stay home when they're sick, um, that all places of employment step up their cleaning, and potentially if it's, if it's in alignment with the type of work to increase the capacity to staff, for staff to work remotely and meet virtually. These are the recommendations that we have for you right now, and now we're going to pass it to Lisa to discuss what we've been doing in our response activities. Thanks. Go. Oh, which one moves you move forward? this way? Thanks. Hello. How are you guys? Um, okay. Yeah, it works. Um, so Boulder County Public Health was actually the first local public health agency to activate our uh, emergency operations plan. We did so on. January 24th, um, at which point we established an instant incident management structure and activated an internal incident management team. I'm the incident commander for the team, um, and we created an, an, an incident action plan. Um, we established objectives, which is standard for an incident action plan. Uh, prevent the spread of COVID-19, provide situational awareness and guidance for response partners, provide public information to the local community, provide guidance and advance warning to local governments, school districts, businesses, and the general public regarding appropriate social distancing measures and what to expect as an outbreak progresses, to assess available resources to support the response and to provide guidance to, and, su and support to administrators in Boulder County. Um, We've gotten a lot of that done. Uh, let's see. We've been reviewing our plans and annexes. We have, um, in addition to our public health emergency operations plan, we also have quarantine and isolation plans, community um, support plans, quarantine support plans, um, and community containment plans. 
and we've been reviewing those with our partners. It happens that we have um, been working on an alternate care site exercise series um, as part of <coughs> pandemic planning for the past almost year and a half now, um, and so that has brought us opportunity to already have reviewed our pandemic plan and our alternate care site plan, and many of these plans with our pa um, partners in great detail before we ever got coronavirus, so we're in good shape for that um, reason. Um, we've notified and activated our response partners, brief community leaders, and we've been um, distributing communications as well. But we continue. Um, one of the things that we are doing that um, Carol alluded to was is monitoring um, people who have had exposure. So we have daily monitoring of people. Um, and we also have activated the quarantine and support plan, which we um, is administered by our housing and human services and community services folks. So they provide case management to people who are in quarantine. This is a unique thing for Boulder County that Boulder County has um, implemented because we recognize that people who are in quarantine are stepping up for the, their community and making a sacrifice, and that it's important that we do the same for them. So we assess whether or not they have adequate financial support when they're out of work for two weeks, that they're getting their groceries, that, that their child care is being dealt with. Anything that they might need in quarantine, we make sure they get. We also have been partnering with the Office of Emergency Management. I think this slide's got China flat fight. So this is you, Mike. You're up. Me. All right. <laughs> Thank you very much. All right. Good evening, Council. Uh, the, the, the focus of emergency management during this event right now is in the coordinating and supporting the incident command structures and all the other. Could you introduce yourself, sir? Oh, I'm sorry. Mike Char, Director of Emergency Management. <laughs> Should have known that. Apology. Uh, and our role is in the uh, support and coordination of our, our response structures. Uh, currently, what we're doing, um, we held an agency administrator meeting, uh, and that is the principals from all the municipalities across the county came together. Uh, we did a briefing with them similar to this. We're continuing with that process uh, for the next two weeks uh, every Tuesday and the idea behind that is to make sure that policymakers are uh, moving with this incident if it escalates up or de-escalates we want to be able to make sure that we're uh, able to make the decisions in, in real time as conditions change. Uh, secondly we're working within uh, continuity of operations planning it's you'll hear the term COOP and that's uh, the process of looking at our internal plans within the city and county organization of how would we deal with things. The COOP model usually is based around a facility interruption or an infrastructure interruption and being able to provide critical uh, city services. We're looking at that now from a different perspective is what would happen if we had more staff that became ill, had to take care of their family members, and we saw uh, some availability issues around uh, executing uh, critical missions. So we're doing some workshops with city staff over existing plans that exists, making sure that that lens is being utilized to evaluate the, the validity of the plan. Uh, we're feeling pretty good of where we are moving forward in relationship to that as, as this moves potentially into the community. Um, the situational awareness side, we are using our EOC technology and, and processes to make sure we're gathering all information from uh, as many different points that we can, assembling that and then being able to distribute that to anyone that may access it. We've given it, uh, our partners all access to that real-time situation situational awareness information and we're holding a coordination call amongst all emergency management agencies uh, within the county including the University of Colorado to Longmont and to other um, um, uh, programs that exist to make sure that that coordination is occurring. So uh, we're not activated in the EOC. We are all under what we call a staff activation. So that means we're taking all available emergency management staff, putting them in support and coordination and performing these functions and making some shifts and some scheduling to make sure that we're able to uh, execute the duties that, that people are looking us to help with. Um, these are the workshops that we're doing coming up soon. You'll see one of them is with the public safety sector. Uh, uh, the incident command structure has a liaison uh, function that wants to engage uh, law enforcement, fire, EMS, the uh, jail, and we're ensuring that the information they need related to public health and their operations is being coordinated and they're having access to epidemiologists to be able to help them with response planning and adjust any operational needs that need to happen. And that'll be a routine meeting. They're setting up a schedule and that'll be starting uh, in, a, in a formal process every Wednesday, I believe, is what they're looking at, and our first one's next Wednesday, so we'll be able to uh, address that issue. There's some emerging issues that have come up, as you can see here. 
one of the things that we have done is uh, work with this, uh, the Spanish-speaking community and uh, engaged our cultural brokers to ask them the messaging we're sending out. Is it appropriate? Is it meeting the needs of the community? And if not, inviting that conversation to be able to make sure that they can reach back to us and say that here's where we could use additional messaging or a change in the messaging. And that is um, then would carry back to our joint information system. So we've created a unified joint information system with Longmont, the city of Boulder and Boulder County being the managers of it, and it's designed to centralize the messaging. And that's really in closing what I'm, you know, for me the biggest issue is are we getting the right messaging out to the community in a coordinated way, and that all the needs of the community are, are gonna be internally processed and submitted into a centralized place where that can be um, either routed to a subject matter expert, the message is properly created, and then released out in a thoughtful and strategic manner so that we don't get a lot of that, that one person said this and, and uh, they're reading misinformation or they're becoming distorted with that. So that's the goal, that structure. Um, we are working on building that process and system out. It should be operational by Friday, and everyone will be working under that structure uh, within the uh, city and county, and that will have an internal focus for uh, messaging with employees and then also an external focus with messaging with the community. So uh, that's all I have. And Great. Thank you very much. Right there. I think we may have some questions for you. Uh, Mike, this one's probably for you. Thanks for coming tonight. Um, what steps have we taken to ensure that our EMS providers um, have all the protective gear they need if they're doing patient transport? Yep, so we are, that's part of engaging uh, our public safety community and uh, we are, there are some shortages being reported. I'm not hearing anything right now that's saying we're at critical uh, stages, but uh, definitely there needs to be a dialogue around what is the level protection, how do you utilize that, and that's part of connecting with uh, the uh, public health liaison so that they can actually evaluate that. So uh, we'll know more when we meet with them, um, you know, but we're not picking anything up right now that there's any crisis with providing EMS services to our community at this time. Thanks, Mike. Anybody else? <clears throat> Thank you all for coming, very helpful. No, no, Jane, do you have any um, comment about how we're coordinating with the county? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so the first thing to note is that we placed on our website today um, information about the coronavirus with a link to the CDC and all of these organizations is on there. So if people need accurate information, that's available. We've sent an email to all of our staff talking about best practices. And Patrick von Kaiserling, along with Barb Halpern at the county, are joint co-chairs of the joint information system that Mike Chard is is working with with the with the region so we are right in the center of the information place Mike was able to come to our staff agenda meeting on Monday and we talked with all of our department directors then about refreshing their continuity continuing what is it continuity of operations plans I just keep calling them coop plans um, and so everybody is taking a look at those those were prepared um, mostly with an eye toward a natural disaster and so we want to take a look at how we should change those for a pandemic. So for example, the city manager's office is looking at whether or not we could operate completely remotely in the event that there was a full quarantine. So um, every, everybody in the, in the city, all the department directors are taking a look at that so that we can keep um, efficient operations going, essential services going um, during a, a time of pandemic. So we, we think we're on it and you know ready to respond um, using the EOC and public health as our main sources of information. Thank you. And just wanted to clarify, would that could we hold meetings remotely if we needed to? I, I would just like to note when when they started talking, I realized I was sitting like this, and I was like, dang it, like that's rule number one, right? And all of us were touching our faces during that presentation. So I, I'm a little bit worried about uh, the pandemic, maybe a little bit farther down the line than we think it is, because. We can't currently test people unless they've either traveled or are at the level of having to be hospitalized. So assuming that it becomes pandemic maybe quicker than we think, or, and I'm understanding that city manager's office may work remotely, can we continue to do this business so we don't get behind? Can we work remotely? You can't meet remotely. I'm just checking. There's a provision in the emergency powers about uh, meeting outside of the city, but um, there is no provision for um, remote council meetings, calling in or video or anything. 
So having just come from a charter committee meeting, would that require a charter change? It would be helpful to have a charter change. On it. <laughs> Thank you, Mary. The, the less that we can expose people to when the time comes and everybody wants to be part of meetings when an important issue is up, I think we have to look without wanting to cancel things as they're coming up with how to, to be efficient and not promoting the pandemic. Okay, anyone else? It's a serious situation, so I think, Rachel, to your point, we can certainly have conversations as we need to, even if we need a charter change, maybe we could do something very quickly. So, next up, I'm gonna read a declaration. Okay. Okay, so um, <clears throat> we've got folks coming up here who are gonna be part of this. Um, one, one thing that we want to do is call attention to the fact that this is a census year and the responding as a community to the census is really important because lots of important things come as a result of <clears throat> uh, an accurate count and we wanna be well represented and so the motto for this year is everyone counts in Boulder County and so we are working with a bunch of partners here to, to make sure that we get as responsive uh, a, a <clears throat> response to the census as we can. So I'll read this and then I'll have each one of our partners say a few words. So Census Awareness Month, March 2020. April 1st, 2020 is Census Day for the United States of America pursuant to Article 1, Section 2 of the U.S. Constitution. The 2020 Census, <clears throat> a once in a decade population count of every person living in the United States, will open on March 12, 2020 and continue through July. The target date for community members to take the census is by May 12th. The correct apportionment of federal representatives to each state, as well as billions of federal dollars for public health, education, transportation, child and elder care, food assistance, emergency preparedness, disaster response, and many other critical programs and services depends on complete and accurate age, population, and other demographic information gathered every 10 years through the census. An accurate census is required for the proper allocation of representatives in the U.S. House of Representatives Representatives and the Colorado State Legislature and is used in the redistricting of state and county voting districts. Census information is critical for planning future city services and to be responsive to community needs. Information collected by the U.S. Census Bureau is confidential and protected by law. Any data related to the census can only be released in aggregate form that does not identify individual respondents. The City of Boulder's Complete Count Committee is working to ensure everyone counts in Boulder and is also supporting efforts of other Complete Count Committees in Boulder County, including the University of Colorado Boulder, Boulder County Nonprofits, and the City of Longmont to increase participation in Boulder. The City Council of the City of Boulder, Colorado is committed to partnering with the U.S. Census Bureau to ensure a complete and accurate count of our community. So I will turn this over to Phil Kleisler with the planning department here at the city. Thank you, Mayor, members of council, community members here and, and afar. Um, we're really here tonight because this is the month where the 2020 census finally goes live. Um, and as um, described in the mayor's declaration, um, the 2020 census really is safe, easy, super important, and it is uh, going live any day now. In fact, if uh, community members wanted to mark your calendars, the online survey goes live in nine days, four hours, and 50 minutes. <laughs> Um, and so just to give a sense about what to expect, um, everyone, most people will be receiving a postcard, a letter in the mail with directions on how to take the census, this, uh, the 2020 census. Um, this is the first year that you'll be able to actually complete it online. Um, and you'll also be options to call in over the phone or speak to somebody in person. Um, but just to back up just a moment, about this time last year, the Boulder City Council recognized that the 2020 census was a pretty critical thing for our community 
community to get right, counting every person once and in the right place. Um, and it was around this time last year that council had a discussion around, we need to start um, having conversations with community members, service providers, and just people interested in the census in general. And that's when council directed staff, guided staff into the development of a complete count committee. And since then, we've been meeting on pretty, a pretty regular basis. Some of our partners are here with us this evening, and they wanted to just say a couple of words about their involvement locally. Um, if you want to learn more, please email census at bouldercolorado.gov. We have a training to arm you with all the information you need to be a census ambassador next Friday, March 13th, 9.30 in this room, the City Council Chambers. And so I'm joined here on the stage this evening um, by Sierra uh, Dykstra, CU Boulder Student Government Census Engagement, Engagement Chair. Um, uh, Pamela Craig of Boulder County and Chris Sparge with the Community Foundation of Boulder. And so, just a few. Um, yeah, so like you said, hi. I am a student here representing CU Boulder's efforts with the census. Um, CU student government is also working with CU's administration along with the chancellor's office to make sure that all of our students, faculty, and staff members are represented in this year's census as the student population is extremely underrepresented and we want to make sure that Boulder County doesn't get chipped in the next 10 years um, with a lack of turnout. So I am just really quickly want to read a statement from our chancellor as well. Well, as Colorado's flagship public research university, we consider it a part of our mission to prepare, inform, and engage citizens. This census calls upon all of us to define our community in a singular yet communal act that will support us in a multitude of ways over the next decade. I encourage you to encourage any young people in your life or people who may be going to college right now to partake in the census. It's often something that is um, overlooked, and a majority of people who are in university right now cannot even conceptualize um, how impactful 10 years can be, so make sure that you are engaging with the young people in your life to encourage them to t partake as well as yourselves. Thank you. Okay. So as the Boulder County 2020 Census Campaign Manager, it's part of my job and my coworker who is the outreach coordinator to make sure that the resources that are needed in the community and the entire county are available so that all of you can help get your voices out there to encourage a complete count. So we have all manner of material that have been designed to educate people about what the census is, how they participate, to address all the myths and any kinds of questions you can imagine. So if you determine that you want to be more involved and get some of this material out into your areas, then please um, please contact us. Um, it's pcraig at bouldercounty.org, and we'll make sure you get the, the material that you need. Thanks. Uh, so I'm Chris Barge with Community Foundation Boulder County, and we are just so honored to be a part of this census outreach effort. Uh, Pamela and Sierra are two of 21 uh, on the census outreach campaign team across Boulder County who are making sure that the historically hard to count populations uh, are counted uh, this time around is so important both for political representation Colorado is due to get an eighth uh, uh, member of Congress and for federal dollars. Uh, every no's not counted is $2,300 per year that does not land in our community in the form of 55 different ways that federal funding lands for sources like education, transportation, uh, food assistance, and uh, the list goes on. Historically hard to count populations include our students, they include uh, families with kids zero to five. You'd be surprised how many families with babies underfoot um, forget how many are in their family when it's time to fill out the census. They include uh, people uh, who are uh, experiencing uh, financial stress. They include Spanish speaking and immigrant residents. Uh, they include our mountain neighbors uh, in our uh, rural areas. Um, and they include seniors and people with disabilities. And so there are cultural brokers, people who share a common uh, background uh, uh, with the populations that are historically hard to reach uh, all over the county that are doing this outreach. And it's made possible uh, because of a Census 2020 fund that generous donors have contributed to at the Community Foundation, mm -hmm. as well as uh, partner funders, including Boulder County, the Colorado Health Foundation, DOLA, and the Next 50 Initiative. If you feel 
feel uh, called to contribute to this effort, please get in touch with the Community Foundation. You can just Google us and contribute to the Census 2020 Fund. Uh, and we are doing a rapid response uh, directed grant making protocol where we are um, granting the money as soon as it comes in so that teams of people such as uh, Craig and Sierra uh, can be out there advocating for this important cause. Thank you all very much. Thanks for being here. Thank Appreciate you. it. Yeah. Okay, I think next is open comment. So with that, um, when I call your name, please be ready to speak. I'll call three names at a time. So open comment tonight starts with Stephen Heidel, followed by Sarah Murray and Sammy Lawrence. Stephen, are you here? No, Stephen. So then we'll go to Sarah Murray, Sammy Lawrence, and Riley Mancuso. Good evening, council members. Thank you for the opportunity to speak. My name is Sarah Murray, and I'm the executive director of Women's Wilderness. If you've not heard of us, we're a local nonprofit that's been here for about 21 years, and our mission is to support girls, women, and LGBTQ plus people in accessing their power and improving their health through connections to the outdoors and to community. We are also the proposed tenant for the historic Harbick Bergheim House that you'll be seeing in your consent agenda tonight. Tonight. And I'm here to speak to you a little bit about our bid and why we are a fit. Uh, I'd like to read a quote from a historical document that I found about why the city bought the Harbeck Bergheim House, which is now valued at around $3 million um, back in the 70s. And it was to provide a Quote, a cultural center for encouragement of nature study and interpretation, conservation, gardening, and related activities, as well as various recreation classes. I think you'd be hard pressed to find a better tenant for that space than Women's Wilderness. Uh, we are doing a lot of backpacking, rock climbing, canoeing uh, for all people, but especially people that are least likely to be outdoors. Um, we serve about two thirds of our participants are living under federal poverty guidelines, about a third are people of color. We intend to use the Harbick Bergheim House in a multi, kind of mixed use way, multi dimensional way. It will be a home for us, but that's only probably about 25% of the space. We will also be using the very top floor, which is this beautiful, about 1,000 square feet of attic, as free community space for events, for nonprofit purposes, um, and community building purposes. And lastly, we're going to be using about half the space as a co working for nonprofits like ourselves, many of whom have a hard time finding affordable rent in the city anymore. So we are delighted to be in front of you today. I'd like to thank Yvette and Margo, Tina, Caitlin, and the team at Parks and Recs who have done a great job in this negotiation and looking forward to moving forward in the process. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Murray. Um, Sammy Lawrence, Riley Mancuso, and then Patrick Murphy. So repeating myself one last time from the last city council meeting, thank you for y'all's accommodation. I appreciate it. It's a simple thing, but thank you. Um, I have forgotten my phone, so I'm going off memory, and as we know, some of my memory is very terrible. First thing is I'm actually here today to speak in support of the people who are seeking support in sanctuary cities, and the sanctuary city especially for Boulder. It takes only a mere seconds to confirm um, that we are as we say we are and to ease the stress of others. Likewise, I wanted to address as well that there was someone who mentioned that there was a ballot that had been voted for by our constituents, our citizens. And it is my hope and prayer that city council takes it to account to enacting this if it has been wished and requested to by the, cities, the city. I appreciate that. And finally, um, I have something completely different than what I was originally going to say because I'm going to have to wait for next city council meeting to approach that. I had a gentleman two to three weeks ago, about my bad, a month and a half ago, that was stuck outside in the cold, in the snow specifically. He was at the First Presbyterian Church utilizing their feed every Thursday. 
this man was not allowed to go inside because the church does not need to comply with ADA law from what I've garnered because they are tax exempt. And as a man who has seizure issues and a brain injury, I wanted, I wanted a, a companion like that. And it scares me that I would not be able to have that potentially if I were on the streets. Finally, the same man actually addressed to me that he has been getting chemical burns from the snow melt that we are utilizing. And as it stands to say that costs us money, it costs us money not only in hospital care, but likewise taking care of those people on top of it. Thank you, Mr. Lawrence. You're welcome. Thank you. Riley Mancuso, Patrick Murphy, Mark Galband. Um, good evening, City Council. Um, my name is Riley Mancuso. Um, I am also here tonight to ask the council to please um, reaffirm Boulder's commitment to being a sanctuary city and to actively resisting cooperation um, with Immigration and Customs Enforcement um, in targeting um, immigrant and undocumented members of our community. Um, I urge the council to um, please listen to people like Ingrid, Ingrid and Colada La Torre, who, is, who are seeking sanctuary in our community. Um, in considering future policy. Um, I also ask the council to once again consider revoking off-duty police availability for BI Incorporated and other corporations involved in the for-profit um, incarceration and immigration enforcement industries um, as the city already prohibits it for marijuana and alcohol businesses. Um, and as the council briefly did last year, um, these, um, these uh, BI in particular does a tremendous amount of harm. Um, the ankle monitors that it has manufactured um, are, have been known to cause um, electric shocks, burns, and, um, and injuries to the people who are forced to wear them as well as being humiliating um, and um, unnecessary. Um, and um, uh, so, yes, I, I urge the council to reaffirm Boulder's commitment as a sanctuary city and consider revoking off-duty police access to BI. Thank you. Thank you. Patrick Murphy, Mark Gelband, and then Makina Lambert. My name is Patrick Murphy, I live in Boulder. This is the continuation of the 24 articles of the Muni Naughty List. Article 16, failure to get a significant majority of voters to support anything other than limitations on the Muni. Article 17, Boulder's early plans assumed no requirement to submit a separation plan to the PUC, assumed acquiring a 30-mile transmission loop without FERC approval, <clears throat> assumed forcing Excel to serve its customers over city-owned facilities, assumed forcing Excel to design, build, and test Boulder's side of the system, assumed forcing Excel to finance Boulder separation and be paid after completion, assumed Excel would finance its own expenses for Boulder's municipalization, assumed that a third party would do the work for Excel. All of these assumptions were wrong. Article 18, Boulder recently assumed it could get all cost estimated by 2020, but it never did. Costly court cases will drag this out to at least 2021, but perhaps it never will. Not until 2025. Do you want to end the muni? I can tell you how. End the muni.org and let real carbon reduction begin now, not five years from now. Just search on end the muni, one word. You'll find out how to end the muni with democracy and full truth. We need more of that to be continued with Articles 19 through 24. The planet burns, 
floods and dies while Boulder fiddles. Time to burn the fiddle. Thank, Thank you. you, Mr. Murphy. Mark Gelband, Makina Lambert, and Lisa White. Mark Gelband, 505 College. Uh, this was a recent plan boulder tweet. We prefer a horizontal wall of green space to surround our city. I think in 2020, there's nothing funny about joking or joking about a wall, and it's a shame that none of our counselors have um, said anything about this. I want to know why Carlos Hernandez is no longer working with the city, and I feel like the city's strategy for responding to CORA requests is to obfuscate. You don't tell somebody, and in, 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 with all due respect to your award, Jane, and you know I've complimented you plenty of times, but with all due respect, you do not say, not a good fit. That's what you say to a shoe salesman or to a tailor. That doesn't describe why someone leaves employment. What is the height limit in the city of Boulder? It's 55 feet. It was done by a vote of the people. It's in the charter. But what is the height <clears throat> limit in the city of Boulder? It's 38 feet currently, and that's at council legislating through moratoria. Why? You can see four, at least, of Boulder's most iconic buildings there. That's the Academy, the Boulderado, the Courthouse, the Shambhala Center. All of those buildings violate our height limit, and we responded to the Colorado building there, but ironically, we just landmarked that building. What is the definition of height? I wish I had my glasses on, because I can't read, but it has something to do with 25-foot radius and the tallest wall, even though the tallest wall often isn't the tallest wall on a building. And how many ways do we measure height in the city of Boulder? At least six. I'm going through this quickly because I want to get to this. I talked last time about legal non-conforming structures, and I just want to say that the ADU map is incorrect and does not account for compatible development or solar shadow ordinance. Thank you, Mr. Galban. Thank you for not interrupting me this time. Makina Lambert, Lisa White, and Leslie Glustrom. Hello, Council. My name is McKenna Lambert. I live in Boulder and go to see you. These are my friends. And together, we have been working on a community-based project focus focusing on supporting women and families living in sanctuary in Colorado for fear of otherwise being deported. We have been working closely with Ingrid Encalada La Torre, who has been living in sanctuary in Boulder for two and a half years now, meeting with her weekly to discuss how we can best support her as she fights for her right to a pathway to citizenship. I have learned this past year that so much of immigration justice work is reactive. It has to be. For example, someone is detained by ICE and an immediate action must be taken to advocate for them. Or someone has to pay outrageous legal fees for an immigration attorney and we qu quickly scramble to fundraise. Tonight, we have a rare opportunity to be proactive. On Valentine's Day, the Trump administration announced their intent to send an elite tactical unit called BORTAC into sanctuary cities that will essentially function as an immigration SWAT team and aid ICE in detaining and deporting undocumented people. They're highly militarized and being deployed to heighten the administration's fear-mongering tactics. Right now, Boulder is not on the list of sanctuary cities under attack, but that doesn't mean that someday we won't be added to that list, so we must act now. What many people don't realize is that sanctuary is a political term, not a legal one. It is a promise to the community that local law enforcement will not assist ICE when they come into our city to carry out their anti-immigrant agenda. However, if we, the people, do not demand that our elected officials hold our local law for enforcement accountable, our Sanctuary status has no weight. It protects no one. We are lucky here in Boulder to have a DA that is supportive of our sanctuary policy, but unfortunately we have a sheriff who quietly continues to work with ICE and undermine not only our values, but also our safety. We are here tonight to thank you for how supportive you have been in the past and ask that in light of recent threats at the national level, you reaffirm your commitment to our sanctuary policy by passing a new resolution, one that is specific to Ingrid and one that can do more than just serve as a symbolic gesture. Thank you so much. Thank you. Lisa White, Leslie Glustrom, Caitlin Larson. Hello, Council. My name is Lisa White, and I live in Boulder. 
along with many others, I was extremely impressed by the newly hired former transportation director, Carlos Hernandez. He had a vision. He talked about the role being his dream job. He wanted to support and empower transportation staff. And importantly, he had experience working on projects with the city and the knowledge of what needed to be done to make forward progress on the transportation master plan. So as you can imagine, two weeks ago, I was extremely disheartened to hear the news that Carlos had resigned. I have to wonder why he was not a good fit, and I can't accept that statement at face value. My observations and the resignation do not add up, and it seems unfair not to disclose with the community what actually happened. I believe former Transportation Advisory Board members, Bill Riggler and Johnny Drozdick, that our transportation department is in crisis. We have a better multimodal system than a lot of the US, but we have stopped having momentum years ago, and we are falling behind other US cities. We need to acknowledge the issues we have around safety, air pollution, noise pollution, and quality of life for Boulder residents and workforce. I want to be clear that my statements are not a reflection of our planners or public work staff. The department has a lot of amazing employees. Instead, I'm commenting on the trajectory of the department, which I believe is a function of leadership. It's time for Boulder to regain its leadership status when it comes to transportation. This means investing resources in creating safe, affordable, and convenient ways for people to get around town. But just as important, it means having the political will to actually make progress rather than standing still. Empowering staff to make forward progress is how we will attract and retain the best talent to move forward towards our TMP goals. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Wright. Yeah. Leslie Glustrom, Caitlin Larson, and Janet Doherty. You wanted to ask her a question? Maybe at the end, if she's still here. <laughs> Evening Council, Leslie Glustrom, I live in Boulder, and as always, I want to thank you on top of everything else you do for taking, for also paying attention to climate change because of the incredible pain and suffering it's causing around the planet. So as most of you know, our greenhouse gas emissions, about half of them come from electricity. That's why we talk so much about electricity. Um, and I always want to look at this sort of comparison. I think I talked last time about my non-existent artistic <laughs> skills. This is the amount we spend on examining the possibility of forming a public power municipal utility. This is Excel's after-tax profits from Boulder in the same time, except for that we just got 2019, which actually you can see 2019's after-tax profits are the same size as the whole amount we've spent on municipalization. So now we have to put this on top of this and so my goal is always with a couple minutes to slowly help the council and the community think about this comparison sort of this comparison shopping so uh, oh well with Excel I, I would suggest that the, the pace and the price have been wrong when we get there we've just gotten Excel's 2019 10 K which is where they tell the truth as far as I can tell it's a lot easier than trying to get it out of the Commission and we now know that Excel while they're 30 percent renewable they're still 70 percent fossil fuel that's obviously a step in the right direction to be 30 percent renewable energy but to be 70 percent fossil fuel at this point in time I think is not very defensible the little red bar is the bids, the renewable energy bids that Excel took in their last round. This blue bar is half of the bids they received. So it's one thing to say we're making progress, but they could obviously be going much faster. And it goes back to 2009. They had 15,000 megawatts of wind and solar. Slow walking in 2009 perhaps is understandable, but not now. So thank you so much, Council. Thank you, Ms. Guzman. Uh, Caitlin Larson, Janet Doherty, and Evan Ravitz. My name is Caitlin Larson, and I am the organizer for Ingrid Encalada La Torre, and I will be reading her testimony. My name is Ingrid Encalada La Torre. I currently live in Boulder, Colorado, and I have been a refugee in the Unitarian Universalist Church of Boulder for the last two and a half years. I have three American citizen children. I am an immigrant, a mother, and a woman of color who is fighting for justice through our immigration and criminal justice systems. I have been facing deportation since 2010. In 2011, I pleaded guilty to a felony without knowing the consequences. And for four and a half years, I paid for this felony 
felony through restitution to the IRS, money for lawyers, and two and a half months in jail. I paid to the full weight of the law and complied, complied with everything. However, I was punished double through the law because in addition to paying for my mistake, the doors were closed to me to have legal status here in the United States. Now, because of these broken systems, I have spent two and a half years living in this church. It is extremely difficult because I do not go outside, even to take my children to school. In Boulder, I have seen you all stand up for justice, for immigrants, and for me by approving the Sanctuary City Policy and the People's Resolution. I truly appreciate that because it makes me feel accepted here. I hope you will continue to stand for justice because there is more work that needs to be done, which is why I'm asking you to pass a resolution reinforcing the already approved Sanctuary Policy. You can also stand with me by supporting Nomas Chuecos, an information campaign to help undocumented immigrants know the consequences and avoid using false documents. I ask that if you decide to pass a resolution, that you join me at the Unitarian Universalist Church of Boulder to read the resolution and celebrate its passing. Finally, I encourage the immigrant community not to be scared by the threats by the federal government. <clears throat> Sanctuary City protects people. We immigrants want to follow the laws and not be afraid to send our kids to school, go to the hospital, or go to official buildings. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> Janet Doherty, Evan Rabbits, and Claudia team. Janet Doherty? No. Evan Rabbits, Claudia team, and Anna Ibarra. Evan Ravitz, <clears throat> North Boulder. Um, online petitioning is on the agenda tonight. Online petitioning is simple. Arizona has used it for eight years. Arizona's system is for candidates, but the only technical difference is the text of the petition, in spite of what the city attorney repeatedly tells you. <clears throat> Please look at the system yourselves and So anyway, I've sent you the URL of Arizona's system. Maybe it'll be up on the screen someday. When I suggested this to the Colorado Secretary of State, Jenna Griswold, at a public meeting, she nervously looked away, didn't respond, and also ignored my email. Staff says she has refused to either host Boulder's petitioning system or to share data, including driver's licenses the city could use. I don't know if someone told her not to cooperate or if she's afraid since she's out of her realm of experience. This is a problem with making lawyers responsible for tech projects, as you have with the city attorney. Longtime former councilman Steve Pomerantz has a workable solution. Using only publicly available data, anyone can buy from the county clerk. Please ask staff to adopt it, terminate the contract for an inferior system made under fraudulent circumstances, and accept National Nonprofit MapLite's free offer to implement it, and ask staff to obey the Colorado Open Records Act. They are refusing to give me four videos which have been scrubbed from the website. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Evitz, <clears throat> Claudia Team, Anna Ibarra, and Bob Norris. <clears throat> Good evening, members of council. Ms. Brodigam, congratulations. Thank you. My name is Claudia hansen theme I live in Boulder. And I'm here tonight because I, like Lisa White, am troubled by the resignation of Transportation Director Carlos Hernandez. I have no personal loyalties to Carlos. I did not have a chance to meet him prior to or during his six-week tenure. But I trust the opinion of many members of Boulder's sustainable transportation community that were excited to work with him. Given the time, the resources, and the hope put into this hire, Carlos's early departure is a spectacular failure, no matter where blame lies. If the city stifled his vision, then shame on us for making him think he could make a difference. If he had some irredeemable fault that came to light so quickly, then shame on us for not vetting him more thoroughly. And regardless, shame on us for only attracting one truly standout candidate in multiple national searches. 
Given Boulder's needs and ambitions, the lengthy vacancy at the head of the transportation division is deeply concerning. Meanwhile, positions leading the Go Boulder and Vision Zero programs, both of which are critical to implementing our transportation master plan, are unfilled. And it's only been six months since the Tipton report, which pointed out particularly low morale amongst transportation staff. Ms. Brodigam has disputed this, but from the outside, transportation does look like a department in crisis. And that's a big problem if we hope to bring in another forward-looking leader. And I worry that it compromises Boulder's ability to recruit in other departments as well. I know that personnel matters are sensitive legal territory, but we need transparency here. I understand that several core requests for emails related to Carlos's departure have been filed, and I look forward to seeing them fulfilled in a complete and timely manner. In the meantime, my question tonight, which I hope you will put to the city manager, is this. How does the city plan to recruit and support a progressive transportation leader in the future? Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Thiem. Anna Ibarra, Bob Norris, and Marianne Mahoney. Um, hello, uh, my name is Ana Karina Casas Ibarra, and I live at 4500 uh, 19th Street, Lot 46A, Boulder, Colorado. I have been a, a resident of Boulder for 21 years and my brothers and I grew up in Boulder. In 2010, one of my brothers got deported. In 2012, after a traffic stop, my other bro uh, brother was taken by ICE. In 2015, my dad, after a car accident, was also taken by ICE. I know firsthand the pain, the frustration, and the helplessness of family separation. And like mine, there are a lot of families that have gone through the same situation here in Boulder. Sorry. The torture that people are being put through and the name of Prophet is real. So I am here to thank you for the steps you have taken to support your immigrant community Thank you for your support of the People's Resolution. Thank you for the support um, of Ingrid and Calada. I want to, uh, to ask you to continue this support regardless of the threats of the White House. Please continue your support of the People's Resolution. And most of all, continue your support of Ingrid and Calada, who is one of the strongest women I know, who has continued the fight regardless of the adversity she has gone through which has made a lot of people give up and lose hope. And please, pass a resolution to make your support more than a symbolic gesture. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Ibarra. Bob Norris, Marianne Mahoney, and Sue Prant. Uh, I'm Bob Norris from the Republic of Longmont. Mm -hmm. I would like to thank the two people over here for helping us plan this event this evening. Uh, well, I wanted to talk to you about the connection between public charge and the census. Public charge is one of the really strong anti-immigrant things that have been done by this federal administration that is going to make it much more difficult for you to get immigrants and people of color uh, to sign up for the census because they'll be afraid. So um, the um, Trump administration's Department of Homeland Security posted new regulations that will make the legal process of qualifying for a green card more difficult. Didn't need to be more difficult. Um, the first courts kind of turned this away, but the Supreme Court recently said they can go ahead with it. And this policy has existed for a long time, but they've made it much more difficult. Um, the public charge test occurs when someone is applying for their green card from inside the United States this is called an adjustment of status. Currently, immigration officials, uh, officials applying the test can consider whether an applicant for adjustment or status have used government programs to provide a cash benefit or that pay for um, people to stay in nursing homes. It also counts for uh, food for kids, and I'll explain it a little bit more. Um, the new rule allows immigrant officials also to consider the use of Medicare, SNAP, 
that's the food stamps program, and federal housing programs. People usually don't become from, uh, able to do those until they do get their green card. So let just quickly say that this is really aimed at people of low incomes, children, and stuff. And there's over 100,000 people who have quit taking green stamps and feeding their kids because of the fear of this. So Thank you. Get, uh, get out there and help. I'm Marianne Mahoney, Sue Prant, and Mike Humner. Good evening, Council. Thank you for your leadership. Jane, congratulations on the recognition by your peers. Pretty impressive. Um, just want to take a minute to say we're in the process after our resident sentiment survey, I believe a lot of you have received it, may have read it, that we're embarking on our destination assessment and really a um, asking you as elected officials to take 15, 20 minutes, I'll send a link tomorrow to your, your account, just to look at our destination with a holistic eye. We don't want to do this as an insulated uh, exercise just with our board of directors and the people people in our industry, all of you as elected uh, leaders as well as boards and commissions is who I'm requesting to, to fill this out. What we'll do is this evaluates our destination strength variables, brand, accommodations, our entertainment, our facilities, our events, our infrastructure, how do we function and how do we um, stack up? And with your clear lens, we'll stack up against 500 other destinations around the U.S. to see what do we really want to work on as an organization, um, as a tourism leadership, but it, us, us as a community to figure out what can we do together to continue to improve our destination, really for our residents and our quality of life. Just want to say tomorrow you'll get my little email, and thank you for some input. Thank you, Ms. Mahoney. Uh, Sue Prant. Mike Homner and David Prowl the third. Hi, Sue Prant, Community Cycles, how are you? So I sent you a letter earlier this afternoon. I hope you all got and have a chance amongst your many things to read to read. Um, and, but it addresses the situation of transportation. So moving forward, which is what we at Community Cycles really look to do, to move forward to modernize our transportation department and really regain the leadership that we had nationwide, which we have certainly fallen off of. Um, so we recommend a few things. First of all, implementing the 20 is plenty, um, but there's, as with all of them, there's a few rubs here. So we want to implement the 20 is plenty, but implement it soon and on a sooner time trajectory than what has been proposed by the staff last Thursday night, the Vision Zero Partnership meeting and still what I was hearing from the staff today, um, which looks at an end of year timeline. We, we want to get something done this summer that will get us to definitely be it in the first in the state. If we wait till next year, we may not be in the first in the state. If we weren't really want to show that we are leading, leading in transportation, we need the publicity of getting this done soon and and be out there as a place that's that's leading. If Denver does it first, we don't get really any attention for doing it. Um, the second thing is looking at how we can use our restriping program to make make cheap and temporary, but in or rather interim improvements to road safety. We do a lot of gigantic plans that will never get built. I discussed this at length in my letter. Um, we should be looking at interim solutions because we have streets that are very unsafe now, and we need to look at how we can fix them without oodles of money and tens of years to do it. So please read my letter. I hope to hear from you guys, and I hope to keep this issue on the table and not just have it swept under the rug because 18 months was too long to w wait for the ne next transportation director. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Prant. Mike Hominer, David Prowl the third. Good evening, Council. My name is Mike Hominer. I'm a Boulder resident. I recently sent you a letter uh, advocating about the homeless and the coronavirus. 
Um, I think when we turn around, we're all in this together. Uh, we don't want to lose the fact that we do have those that are unhoused, that are staying at the shelter and bridge house in, in big masses. And I wanted to make sure for the record that I wasn't criticizing what bridge house and what the shelter do. The only thing is that those people that are on the street don't have a place to shower. They don't have a place to isolate should they become infected. Um, what are we going to do for that? Uh, you know, the, the only thing with, the, with both Bridge House and the shelter, they don't open their showers up to anybody that's not been able to get inside. And I think that's, you know, a use of a resource that we underutilize there. Everybody wants to be clean and take a shower and get washed, and they can't do that here. The other thing is, our, you know, our bathrooms in our cities are usually not encouraged to be used by the homeless, should I say nicely. Um, I, I just want you guys not to lose the sight on the ball for those that are, that are marginalized as it is. Um, I thank you and good luck. Thank you, Mr. Humner. David Prowl III. Going once, going twice. I think with that, we'll close open comment. Um, sorry, uh, do we, we want to start with staff and yeah. see? Okay. Yeah. This was yeah. what we do next. So staff, do you have anything that you'd like to address from open comment? Yeah, thanks. <clears throat> so first, um, I want to thank Mr. Homner for the email that he sent us um, raising the issue of homeless individuals and the coronavirus. So um, that prompted us to be speaking with Mike Chard and our agency partners, and they are going to be meeting later this week, I believe, to begin to understand how we can serve that population. So um, that was a good call and, and a good reminder for us to be working together. And of course, um, you may have seen an email where we responded to Mr. Homner earlier this evening, so hopefully he's aware of that. So the, the real issue that got brought up tonight by several people um, is the issue of the Transportation Department. Um, as I have spoken with each one of you, I don't know why Carlos left. He gave us eight minutes notice when he left. Um, I wish I knew. I really, really loved Carlos. I respect him so much for what he brought to our organization, and I find it devastating as well that he chose to leave. I don't know why that occurred. The thing that Carlos gave us that was so amazing is he gave us hope <clears throat> that things could really move forward in transportation for the city. And when your hopes are raised, and then dashed, it feels so bad. And that's what I feel the community is feeling, I know I am, and also the staff members that worked with him were feeling that as well. Um, and, and so receiving criticism about the department is really hard for them to hear because they too are very sad that this occurred. What, what I appreciate is that Sue Prant met with me and Tanya yesterday, and, and also we had phone calls last week, and also all of the TAB members have reached out to me, and I have meetings with all of them next week to talk about what their concerns are, what their hopes are for the future. The items that Sue brought up in her letter to you and tonight I think are incredibly valid, and Tanya and I made a commitment to her, and we make it to you tonight, that we'll be working with the transportation staff to address some of the issues that she raised. I think they're completely um, reasonable and valid issues, and we're going to be doing that. The search firm that we used um, and successfully found Carlos through has a contract with us, and my understanding from reading the contract is that they have an obligation if the person that we hire does not stay for 12 months to assist us in moving forward to find a new transportation director, and we will be working on that in the, the next week or two, trying to get that out as soon as possible. 
you know, the thing is that when I say that, it's like, oh, maybe we'll get somebody in a few months. This was a hard, hard search. And a person coming to Boulder knows what our history is, our proud history around transportation, and they know that it, this is um, a community that has really high expectations. And so I simply can't promise that we're gonna find somebody as great as Carlos in a short period of time, but we are going to try our hardest to find someone and, and will not accept anything less. And it, it could take a while. Um, in the meantime, we're trying to figure out ways that we can um, make sure that our Vision Zero engineer gets hired, that our deputy gets hired, that these other positions that have not been filled are getting filled in the near term with amazing people that have the bold vision that our community and that our council also has. Um, we are doing our best to make that so. And, you know, I can only end by saying this is so unfortunate, and I'm sorry for our community that this happened. Thanks. Rachel. Thanks for that, Jane. Um, a couple of things. Oh. I had a couple of things. Oh, I didn't know. Was this about? It is about Carlos. I don't, yeah, I don't so, wanna... so I thought we'd just follow up right. with that directly and then come back um, to Tom. So I'm, I'm with you, Jane, and feeling pretty devastated that Carlos left and was also excited about um, his vision and energy and passion for the job. Um, and I think that part of what the community feels is a lack of transparency and understanding. And I understand you're saying you can't give us a, you know, an answer that you don't have. Um, but one thing is CORA requests. I know there's been some frustration about that. So wanted to make sure we followed up on um, that. And then um, I'm also really excited about the new police chief. And you know, having a culture in the city where people feel supported, and especially people that we are excited about, want to stay. So, you know, Tipton concerns and um, how we, as a, a city council staff and community, can support these great individuals. I don't know what more needs to be done, but maybe a little update on where we are with Tipton, um, and and how we are working to make sure that we are a city that can recruit and keep the great talent and also the CORA request, thanks. So can I respond on the CORA request? Um, so we have a policy that says that uh, you get your first hour free of search time, and then every after that you pay $35 an hour for searches. Um, Mark Geldman, I think, has issued 12 different CORA requests, breaking each one down by word so that each one's separate so he gets his free hour for, for one. He issued them on Saturday and Sunday. So our staff is working on them. Uh, there is no delay. We are one of the most transparent cities in the state. Um, that, that, that criticism is particularly unfair, particularly coming from Mark, who's kind of playing a game with the rules. And, and also, our staff doesn't work on Saturdays and Sundays. They work pretty hard during the week. So the, the, we, got, we got most of his requests yesterday. Um, I think that's right, yeah, yesterday. So uh, he'll get the answers. Um, the fact is, he's trying to show that, that Jane fired Carlos, and that's not true. So he's not gonna find the information. We, can't, we don't give information we don't have. The other thing, uh, Mr. Ravitz raised Cora um, about some meeting videos not being on the website anymore. Um, they were rotated off. Um, we are in the process of identifying all council meeting videos and seeing if we can digitize them. The challenge that we have is that council meeting videos go back many years, and we have some in Betamax, some in VHS, so, some in various different formats. We're working to, to, to analyze those and figure out how we can get them all digitized up online. They will eventually be. And in, in, in the website, they were there. Mr. Rabbits. That's really uncalled for, Mr. Rabbit. It's called for. No, it's not. That's why I said. So the other thing Mr. Rabbit said was that we shouldn't have the city attorney running the online petitioning system. The city attorney does not run the online petitioning system. The IT department and the clerk's department run it. I present on it because of that. Uh, Mr. Rabbit is abusive to our staff, and I, I can handle it. Other folks, it's not fair. So the only reason I'm the face of the online petitioning system is because that's the way he behaves all of the time. And it's unfortunate, it's unfair, it's unfair to our staff. But to be clear, I do not run <laughs> the online petitioning system. I only report on it. I actually had two other things, Sam. If, if oh, well, so let's, we have an exchange going back and forth. Do you want to talk about what we're going to do as far as the discussion around Tipton? Yeah, absolutely. So. <clears throat> 
as a context setting, you know, the Tipton report was issued back in September. That's six months ago. Do you think we've been sitting on our hands since then? We have not, and you all know it, because you've met with our staff that has explained to you that we have the next phase that we have completed. And it is a very positive phase of moving forward that it was designed by staff members, nominated and selected by their colleagues, not by any person in power in the city. And so that final report, I signed off on it today, and it will be issued later this week, indicating what our next steps are. Um, Bob Tipton continues to work with us as we move forward to the next steps. At CAC on Monday, CAC agreed that Mr. Tipton could come to speak to council on April 14th at the study session, which is our next study session because this is March and we don't have a study session in March, um, to explain to you the status that we're at. Um, I'm sorry that that's six weeks away because I want to assure you that things are moving in an incredibly positive direction and I'm feeling super hopeful about it all. Uh, a thing that I just have to say out loud is that the Tipton report has become the new Folsom and that's not fair. Um, we've moved past both of those and we're on into the future and things are looking much brighter. Um, and the. The thing that happened with Carlos's resignation really hurts that, and I'm so sorry about it. I wish it had not happened, but um, our, our staff is positive and moving forward, and we <clears throat> are going to make a bold statement around transportation in this community. Thanks. Great, thanks. Okay, Tom? So I just wanted to point out, several people mentioned uh, the city's sanctuary city policy. The city actually has a sanctuary city ordinance, which is much higher level than a policy. Uh, council adopted in January of 2017. It can be found in section 12-5-2 of the Boulder Revised Code. And it absolutely prohibit, prohibits city employees from cooperating with the immigration uh, service. It also prohibits the use of any city funds to support any immigration uh, service activities. So it's a fairly strong ordinance. Uh, you could adopt a resolution reasserting it. There's no, no problem with that. But I didn't want people to think that we were just operating under a policy. Uh, council took a much stronger step in 2017. Uh, thanks, Tom. That was helpful. Tom, one of the uh, <clears throat> speakers, um, Alleged that uh, Sheriff Pele was, um, I, I think Boulder County is a sanctuary county as well. The commissioners passed a, a resolution, I believe. I think that's right. Yeah. And one of the speakers alleged that Sheriff Pele was working around that or, or, or doing things that would not be consistent. Do you know anything about that allegation? Not to my knowledge. J J J Boulder County, of course, runs the jail, and yeah. that presents some challenges to um, to Sheriff Pele. The, the, um, the immigration, net, the ICE has a, a practice of issuing detainer orders, which are unconstitutional. Uh, sheriff Pelly does not want honor those orders, nor does any sheriff in the state of Colorado, mm -hmm. uh, because they've been found to be unconstitutional. He is required to order, to, to, uh, to obey a lawful order issued by a court, and I assume that he does. And uh, our, our officers are required to do that as well. They can't, so if, if there's an issue, a, an order issued based on probable cause or uh, a conviction that uh, is issued by a court, and ICE requires that he produce somebody, he has to do that. There's no way around that. Uh, but he does not cooperate with the, the detention orders as some sheriffs around the country do. Thanks. Aaron? Thanks, thanks for that, Tom, and for clarifying about the strength of the Sanctuary City Ordinance that we passed a few years ago. Anyway, I appreciated the uh, folks uh, coming to speak to us about those matters in our Sanctuary City status. And this, I wonder if Council might entertain the possibility of uh, putting together a resolution kind of reaffirming our commitment to our sanctuary policies. It has been three years and um, there are um, efforts by the federal administration to kind of put sanctuary cities under threat. So this seems like a reasonable time to say, hey, we, we stand behind these policies and, and you know, we have a new council. And so I just want to put that out there for our consideration. So great. Rachel. And I would just add, I'm, I'm not sure what the, is the people's resolution probably not part of the ordinance. So would we separately also reaffirm that, maybe? I'm sorry, what, what is the, the- I think it's called the People's Resolution, or, some, or else whatever is specific to Ingrid. I think there's a resolution that was fairly That was specific. passed during, um, um, actually, a study session last year, year before. Um, 
And it was, it was specific to Ingrid. So um, I think if we're going to have a resolution, they sh it sh could be done together. Yeah. So I, I think it would be worth us, um, especially because there are four of us, I think, new that didn't get the chance to, to express our commitment. And I think it would be uh, a nice gesture to the community to have a unanimous council reaffirming our um, commitment, especially in light of um, essentially an ICE SWAT team that may get deployed at some point to Boulder, a new second circuit ruling that puts more federal funding, I think, at risk, and again, new council members. And I do like the idea of us going to Ingrid to present the resolution. I think that would be, uh, especially if we incorporate the people's resolution, I'm happy to go and be a representative, but I think it would be uh, awesomely powerful if we all went. So, so why don't we why don't we bring this back to council in just a second and have a full discussion of it when we do council? Bob, did you have some? I mean, sorry, Bob. Tom, did you have something else? No, that's it. Uh, it was it. Res Mary's right. It was resolution twelve thirty one that council passed in, in support of Ingrid. Okay, great. So we can start with that then. I'm coming back to council. Um, Adam. Yeah, one piece of this that. I just have a question on it, and I'd love to have a little time with council to discuss is the in uniform off duty officers at private companies. Um, we haven't had an opportunity to discuss that as a council. I think that's an interesting policy that we have in general, and I think it's worth just spending a little time on at some point. So, like the officers you see at Whole Foods who are technically off duty but in uniform in police vehicles, that type of stuff. Question. And so, uh, no, 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 you don't shout out, no, no. Uh, so, well, you can write us an email with your question and we'll respond to you, thank you. So, I, I think, so there's two things now on the table, why don't we take them in order. The first thing being the um, proposal to do a resolution. Um, I think that sounds great. Um, and I think we could probably, I mean, you have each listed some of the things that have changed in the last three years. I think one of the most important things to do would say what's new that we are not um, happy with and that we want to make sure that we are responsive to. Um, so is there any objection to doing a resolution? I have no objection. I just, um, let's, let's not, we have a very tight public hearing schedule, so I just would like to ask not that it it be scheduled as a public hearing and bump other things off. Okay. And and so what we'll take that to CAC and see if we can get that scheduled and assigned and then um, figure out when that's going to be. I would suggest that we read it here in council chambers so it gets televised as well as then going and presenting it. Um, if people are good with great. that. Okay. That's great. And then the second thing, I think that should just be a request to CAC. If you wouldn't mind, um, send a request to CAC to ask that we at least discuss revisiting um, the policy of the officers. We will have a new uh, police chief coming in, so it's probably a discussion worth revisiting. There's new council members. We did go through this before, and there had been a process previously around BI and a discussion around it and a decision, but it doesn't seem unreasonable to reopen it again with the things that have changed. The only question I'd ask again as a process one is, is um, I don't know if this is a short discussion or a long discussion. Um, if it's a longer discussion, it does feel like a work plan adjustment to me. I mean, if we're going to have staff do some work about off-duty officers and what our policies, and then if we're going to come back and we have a public hearing on it, it does feel like a work plan increment adjustment. I know it's unfair to the four of you that didn't go through that last year, um, but um, I'd like to suggest, unless staff thinks it's a really, really short period of time, that this come back at the mid-year um, retreat and for consideration of work plan in the second half of the year, if that's okay with you, Adam. Yeah, so, I just, I don't, I don't want to dodge the, the question. I just, we, we've kind of loaded up the front half of the year. I'm not sure we'll have time. Totally, yeah, to I totally get it. It's just something I want brought up at some point. And I think it is good with the new police chief to revisit. Yeah. And it'll give her opportunity to obviously get, get up to speed and participate in that as well. Great. Yeah, that's helpful. Thank you. Uh, just really quick, maybe leading in, I, I agree with what you're saying um, and appreciate Adam bringing it up. Maybe before the mid-year retreat, though, um, we could just get a, a brief update on, or at least something in writing, telling us sort of the history and where we are now so that we know whether we want to pick it up at, at the retreat so we're informed. Mm -hmm. so that seems later. reasonable. If we could get an IP on that and have it called out, perhaps. 
Okay. Maybe just from the yeah. bracket when we heard it previously. I would also suggest we can talk about this at CAC that this could just be a matters. So not to jam our public hearings, we could get our IP and then potentially decide to have a discussion under matters because more policy guidance than necessarily something we need to have a public hearing on. Plus, many of us have been through the public hearing on one side or the other of the dais. So, <laughs> okay. Um, anything else from council? Different subjects? No, I just wanted to say thank you to all the community members who came to speak tonight. Um, and especially, I think it was Ms. Ibarra who shared her personal family story. That was really moving. And um, thank you for sharing that. Good night. Mary? I just wanted to comment on um, the report that was addressing the Tipton report. Um, Adam and I, and I know other council members have had a chance to sit down with staff to go over um, what moving forward looks like. And I have to say that it was a very um, a hopeful um, moving forward um, plan which has a lot of specific or several specific steps and um, implementation and it's it's a really great plan and I just wanted to share that um, coming out of that meeting, I know I felt pretty hopeful and um, I'll add one more thing in terms of, um, I, I had never been up to the, um, the planning area where the, all the plans are and there's going to be some good improvements there in terms of um, moving away from paper plans to actual um, computerized system. And that's going to make a huge difference in terms of um, personnel. And um, I just wanted to share that because it is related to um, the transportation um, issue that was brought up tonight, which um, I have sat down with Jane and spoken about this, and there really is no explanation for why Car Carlos left. There really isn't. And um, I wish we could get up here and just say he left for this and that reason, but there simply isn't. And um, so I just wanted to um, reinforce that and to share what um, the sentiment behind the Tipton Report action plan that um, Adam and I sat on last week. And, and to follow up on that, there will be more information. We're gonna have, I think, a 15-minute session here before too long where we review the public's benefit. I know most of us know what's going on, but it, it's helpful to, to share it, so. Okay, anyone else? Okay. Your consent agenda tonight contains items B through G. I just want to comment that it sounds like we've had a nice resolution on the um, Arbeck Burgum House. So thanks to everybody who worked on that. And that seems like a really good fit. And the representative who was here and called out what the intention was when we purchased it. Um, that was really great. Thank you. Mary? So I had a question on that one. Um, and that was trying to understand the two pieces of the revenue stream and I just wanted to understand how it was arrived at because it's, it's a little, um, I had to read it twice to get what was going on. So I just wanted an explanation as to. So our former Parks and Recreation Director, Yvette, will answer this. <laughs> and she was the leader of the department when this all occurred. So Yvette, thank you. And, and has not resigned. <laughs> She's moved on to other departments. Good evening, Council. Um, thanks for your question, Mary. Uh, I believe you're referring to the negotiated term between the city and women's wilderness and how revenue would be split. Um, when we received direction from Council in 2019 to go forward, it was to anticipate covering the cost of operating and owning the home mm -hmm. to the best of our ability. Council gave us direction to pursue things that were at least at cost <coughs> recovery, but would kind of certainly consider the uses um, and try and lean into what the community values were. We ended up in a negotiation with the preferred tenant who you met earlier. 
Hi, Sarah. Um, and with the assistance of our team, we have two parts. One is a flat monthly rent, which is below market rate on the home. This is a 12-room home um, in the University Hill area, and the, the flat rent is $1,600 per month. That is not full cost recovery. But what we did want to encourage, and what we also as a staff appreciated about Women's Wilderness's proposal, was that they wanted to create opportunities for other rentals. Um, with con the consideration and consultation of the Colorado Group, we looked into the full amount of our cost recovery, as well as trying to encourage them, um, but not discourage, subleasing to other organizations and community uses. So the second part of the revenue stream tries to get us a little bit closer to cost recovery. We're not close, but um, it does encourage in a way that says, we want you to be successful. There's a small amount for the city in cost recovery, and we also want to acknowledge um, that they're covering some of the maintenance of the home as well. So it's really getting at cost recovery in three ways. Flat rent, a very small percentage that escalates year over year, from five ultimately up to 10% of their sublet revenue, and then finally, partial costs of maintenance. I do want to point out that in negotiations, we deliberately kept that number very low <laughs> in the hopes that it would encourage um, cost recovery considerations, but also lots of use by other organizations. The rental revenue does not cover any cost of free use by the community in the home. Thanks, Yvette. That's very helpful. Thank you. Any other questions? Yes. Councilor uh, Mark, Kawhi. sir. Um, is there any cap on the ability of the tenant to make non-structural alterations in terms of dollar value or scope? I understand that, that there are limitations in terms of uh, compliance with statute and, and, and that sort of thing, but are there any, uh, is there anything that prevents them from basically gutting the premises and, and, and altering them. Thank you so much for your question. Um, other direction that we received from council was to consider the community value of this very important landmark property. The property remains a city of Boulder asset and a landmark amenity. All exteriors are therefore protected by the local landmark ordinance. When we got to the issue of the interior um, considerations, I want to acknowledge my colleagues in the room, um, your new director of Parks and Recreation, Allison Rhodes. Um, Margot Josephs, who works on public-private partnership, and two people who could not, or three people who could not be with us this evening, Jeff Haley in planning, Tina Briggs in planning um, for our department, and Caitlin Ruby smith We did an extensive serve, uh, study of all of the interior amenities of the home, identifying its special features. Um, those were paid for by the city. and. In an unusual spectrum, but I also want to acknowledge uh, Sandra Giannis is in the room, who's our assigned attorney on this project, uh, we were able to come up with a declaration of use. That protects, once we file it, should you approve the lease this evening, those would protect some of the interior features that were um, set aside for their significance. Um, no other amenities that are affixed to the home could be changed outside of that declaration of use without the city's approval. And actually, I have a question for Tom. Um, in the lease, um, uh, set, well, it's section G to attachment A, there's the prohibition on contracts for public services language, um, which basically says that uh, the tenant shall not knowingly employ or contract with an illegal alien or do business with any company that employs an illegal alien. Is that required language in our contracts? It's required by federal law. Okay. Uh, that's the end of that. Right. And that, that exact terminology is required? Illegal alien? I don't think we say illegal alien. Does okay. it say illegal alien? Uh, yes, it does, language. I believe. Yes. It, it's in the statute. That, that language is documented. That, it's, Sandra's telling me that language comes from federal statute. Okay. Mm -hmm. And so we can't change it? Is that what we're saying? Uh, Sandra, do you want to come up and explain? She knows this area much better than I do. 
Well, it's been a while since I've looked. Introduce yourself. Sandra Yana, City Attorney's Office. <clears throat> it's been a while since um, we've looked at that, but when the law first came out, um, we did some extensive research, and um, in fact, we we were required to use that exact language, and so that's what we've done since the since that law came out. Okay. We, we will certainly take a look at it and make sure it's up to date. I, I doubt it's changed, but I doubt it all. I'm happy to take a look. Unfortunately. Yeah. Yeah. Bob, this is just a thank you to you and your team, Yvette, for, of course, the, um, the house was the home of the Boulder History Museum for decades, and I've spent hundreds, if not thousands, of hours in that building, and I know it inside and out, every nook and cranny, and I really appreciate you um, not only preserving the historic character of the inside of the building, as, as Mark called out, but also finding a really great tenant for the building. So thank you so much to you and your team. We're excited about the uh, partnership, and we thank Council for the opportunity to fulfill against the city's values. All right. uh, Aaron? And just a congratulations to the Women's Wilderness Institute. It's, it's a phenomenal organization that does wonderful work in our communities. It's a, I look forward to the partnership. Thank you. Thank you. Great. Any other issues with the consent agenda? Is this roll call? Or? Yeah, we have a motion. I, how about, I'll move the consent agenda. Okay. Well, I'll be clear about E1 and 2. Well, it, it, are we not passing both? Yeah. You're passing all three. Yeah, yeah, yeah all yeah. three. So it's, Unless you decide not to. I have issues with some of them, but I'm willing to let them go tonight. For and handle a second reading. Yeah, handle it a second reading. Okay. Seconded. So. I think Aaron made a motion. Second. Okay. Motion and a second. It's a roll call vote. We start with Council Member Swetlick. Aye. Wallach. Aye. Weaver. Aye. Yates. Aye. Young. Yes. Rocket. Aye. Friend. Yes. Joseph. Yes. Nagel? Aye. The motion passes unanimously. Your first public hearing tonight is second reading of Ordinance 8381 and 8384 regarding the Marijuana Licensing Authority. Debbie, could you put it? So Sandra Yanis, Deputy City Attorney, will be making this presentation. Good evening, Council. Joined, uh, joining me tonight is uh, Michonne Cook, <laughs> Licensing Manager. And um, I think uh, Kathy Haddock is somewhere in the building. She's also uh, joining us, Senior Council. Um, so tonight, um, we're bringing forward to you a uh, second reading for uh, the change to the uh, slight changes uh, to um, the marijuana board that um, we implemented um, a few months ago. And so let me work my way through that. So um, we're doing some slight tweaks to the to the naming of the board, and so um, when council adopted this in August of 2019, um, the term authority was used in the name of the the uh, board, and unfortunately, it's a um, term of art in the state statute, and so because this board will not be doing licensing right away. Um, we're recommending that the name be changed to either the Marijuana Licensing and Advisory Board or the Cannabis Licensing and Advisory Board. We're also providing in this ordinance some clarification regarding the term of the board members in terms of making sure that they're staggered for the initial board. As you may recall, the member requirements are that uh, members be 21 years of age, they're city residents for five-year terms, a uh, total of seven members, with the option of adding up to two ex officio non-voting members. And just to explain a little bit about the ex officio positions, they were intended for the non-citizen residents uh, from the candidate pool who would otherwise qualify but are prohibited from appointment because of the resident status requirement. 
In terms of the makeup for the membership, we have uh, two members who will be marijuana industry representatives or hemp representatives if you should desire to have the board include uh, hemp as one of its uh, functions. We have two members who will be health or education field and three members uh, that will be community at large. Again, uh, the total number of membership are seven, uh, no more than two terms expiring in one year. Um, this sort of explains the staggering of those memberships. One member having one, one year term, two for a two year term, two for a three year term, and two for a five year term. And that is the extent of my presentation. Questions from council before we open the hearing? Got him. Is that just the standard staggering of terms? Those? Excuse me? Those term limits, are those just the standard staggering that we use in That's what pretty we much every board? for the housing advisory board. Okay. And, and planning board. Okay. And, and the reason is that you don't want uh, too many expiring at once, and you don't want one council within two years to appoint a majority. I get that. Yep. Got it. Rachel. Um, with two members that are supposed to be health and education field, I'm not sure with the current um, application pool as an example that we got two with that, with those credentials, what happens if you don't have enough for one of the particular categories? Don't we? Yeah, I actually we think do. that we have four now, so we don't have to worry about that. <laughs> but just to pursue that a little further, if I may, the, but if we did not, we would reopen the application process that we, we do sometimes for awards? Yes, I think that would be the wise thing to do because really what we want is a balanced um, board, and so it would be important to have that voice on the panel. Okay. Any other questions for staff? Um, public hearing, right? So do we have any, no one signed up, anyone wants to speak to this? Now's the time. Okay, if not, we'll close the public hearing, bring it back to council for discussion. Somebody wanna kick us off, which you prefer. Go ahead, Bob. I think the staff recommendation was for cannabis because of the broadening on hemp, is that right? That's correct, okay. yes. Does anybody disagree with that? So this seems fairly straightforward and non-controversial. Would someone like to make a motion? So, mo so moved. So I assume you're moving ordinance 8384? For the cannabis yes. title. Yes. Second. Okay, we have a motion and a second to pass ordinance 8384. As it's found, any discussion? We had just, I guess I'm, I'm still just a little bit confused on the hemp ramifications because we talked about applicants wouldn't be aware that they were applying for a hemp related board, but we're still going to use this current pool, right? And then in future years, make that more clear. Would that be the intent? I think that's the intent. And I think further to that, sometimes during hemp processing, hemp becomes. Uh, marijuana, so at least the concentration is high enough that it falls under the legal definition. So we can make it more clear in the future, but I think for now it's pretty close. Aaron? Well, and I'll just be clear. I, I don't know exactly how we might regulate hemp. Seems like we'll regulate at least a little bit, um, but we don't necessarily have to uh, do everything that we do with uh, marijuana. But I think to me, this just gives us the flexibility in the name. Right. And whether hemp is licensed or not, we don't know yet, right? And so we license marijuana facilities, not necessarily hemp facilities. So it could just be advisory on hemp and marijuana, but regulatory on marijuana. Okay, any discussion? Okay, show of hands. No, nope. roll call. Roll call, okay. Let's start with Council Member Wallach. Aye. Weaver. Aye. Yates. Aye. Young. Yes. Rocket? Aye. Friend? Yes. Joseph? Yes. Nagel? Aye. Swetlick? Yes. The motion passes unanimously. Your second public hearing tonight is regarding your policy agenda. I'm hoping 
that Carl Castillo is here. We're 25 minutes ahead of schedule. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Darn that efficiency. It's just like yeah. never happened ever. So we're, right. where's Carl's here yet? Do so, I mean, I think while we wait for him to get here, mm -hmm. maybe we can cover just a few of the things that we did at the legislative committee hearing last week. Um, I think a few of the things, there he is, Carl. Come on down. You, you were leaving us adrift. <laughs> <laughs> Carl, this is a new council. We're, yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> you know, I want you to know the, uh, the recording runs a little bit behind <laughs> <laughs> and you guys ran a little bit ahead of what I expected. Uh, good evening council, Carl Castillo, chief policy advisor. And as I catch my breath here, um, the purpose of this agenda item is to quickly update you on some state legislative priorities, your priorities, going to be emphasis on quick because we did have our Council Intergovernmental Affairs Committee hear a uh, rather in-depth presentation on this on Thursday. I will allow you to ask questions if you want to get into the details, otherwise I'll keep it short. The second part is to ask for action on recommendations made by staff and the Intergovernmental Committee. Um, and finally, I want to briefly touch on the encryption legislation. Uh, that was front page of the Daily Camera today, and I think it's probably something that you're interested in hearing about, so I thought I'd give you a little bit of update on that and, of course, be interested in your feedback. Uh, so starting off with uh, the council's first priority had to do with mobile home residents and making sure that we increase their uh, opportunities to purchase and provide additional protections and um, look, look out for the rights and the interests of mobile home residents. Um, we are very, I'm very happy to report that there's two bills that have been introduced. They've been summarized in the memo and um, in other discussions that I've had with you. Uh, they're going along very well. We, the first one, which has to do with the Mobile Home Park Act updates, it's just kind of like a, a series of different reforms that help provide protections. It has to do with retaliation, transparency and equity in utility fees, making sure that there's sufficient infrastructure and water provided, uh, prohibition against unfair rules, um, things like that. That bill uh, passed the committee, uh, the, the local government committee, two weeks ago. It is scheduled to be heard in, on second reading. Um, by, the, by the whole committee of the whole uh, this Friday. And we are in the process of negotiating uh, amendments with the park owners, which is, which is great, because would those, you know, that increases our probability of getting it through, especially in the Senate where uh, our support is a little more narrow. Even better news, HB 1201, it, which is the bill that provides this opportunity to purchase. So essentially if the park owner before they go enter into a final contract for sale of the park, they have to give the residents 90 days and essentially the opportunity to present their own offer. Um, so this is very important. It's been used successfully throughout the nation in conjunction with cities, housing authorities, um, resident-owned communities, ROCs. These are groups that help uh, of residents put together an offer. So very excited about that. And we did uh, get an agreement from the park owners on this, and they did drop their opposition. So this is fantastic news. Um, it should help us quite a bit. Um, it did pass uh, today um, on third reading uh, with quite a bit of majority in the House, and so we're on to the Senate. I can't guarantee this is going to pass, but our odds have gone up substantially. So that's the first piece of really good news. Um, the second bill that uh, Council has asked us to look into is the authority to ban the use or sale of plastics. And uh, you probably recall uh, through an earlier report that I provided that this bill was, Senate Bill 10, uh, was killed in committee. Uh, Senator Williams was the uh, Democrat who voted against it. Um, there is, however, as was also written in the Daily Camera, I think on Sunday, talk about reintroducing it. And so we're working closely with our delegation and the Colorado Municipal League uh, to make sure that that does occur. Um, many would argue that 
having local authority to determine whether or not plastic bags, straws, polystyrene should be banned is preferable to a statewide ban, although I think none of us want to pit these two against each other. Uh, all of them have benefits of, of creating a baseline as well as additional protections. Um, the next bill has to do with regulating pesticide uses. Again, this is a, a preemption matter. The state has preempted our ability to regulate the use and application of pesticides. This bill was just introduced today, Senate Bill 189. Um, it would repeal the state preemption. It also creates express permission for the city. So it isn't just a question of creating a vacuum of you know who has authority. It says cities shall have authority to regulate the use and um, application of pesticides. It does expressly accept the cultivation of marijuana and the production of agriculture. So those are two that are left out and it wasn't for no reason. It was in order to get the Farm Bureau to go neutral. The Farm Bureau is the 800 pound gorilla at the Capitol on this issue and it was quite important to have them drop their opposition. Again, this does not guarantee that there, this bill will go forward. Uh, we feel like we have a good fighting chance, but um, you know, there are still a lot of groups, uh, the pesticide manufacturers, uh, the retail retailers who, who sell pesticides, the landscapers, so don't want to create um, expectations uh, beyond what I've said there. Um, the next one has to do with discouraging e-cigarette and tobacco use, so recall that we passed our ordinance and our, our, our residents, our citizens, or our voters passed an additional measure, um, and what we wanted to do is expand that uh, those issues at the state level. Well, there is bills and there is action to do just that. There is a bill HB 1001, which would raise the age to 21 uh, for persons to whom cigarettes, tobacco products, or nicotine products are sold, and importantly, it would create a state license that could be revoked if the retailer violated that. So it really helps with the enforcement mechanism. The second thing is an, another bill, HB 1319, which prohibits uh, the sale of flavored nicotine products. Um, and I ran this by Tom. Tom reminded me about the importance of making sure that it is, has language to um, clarify the, uh, the loophole that we were finding where some people were creating separate products and flavors that could be added. I've confirmed that it in fact has included that language. So, um, so that's good news. The third measure is a citizen initiative, or actually 18 to be precise, that have been filed to raise taxes on the sale of, um, of tobacco products. Um, the reason they filed 18 is because they're basically polling and testing to see which one's gonna do best before they land on one that they actually start gathering signatures on. And this is, this is kind of typical. Uh, so th some are low taxes, some are much higher taxes. Um, the, the, the one with the lowest uh, tax proposes a dollar and 20 tax on a pack of cigarettes and an equivalent amount applied to other tobacco products and vaping products. Uh, the, the proposal with the highest tax would assess a $2.60 uh, tax on the same. Uh, this money would be used for uh, tobacco prevention and cessation with the bulk of it going to early childhood, which is a priority for our governor, as you know. So that is in the works, clearly not legislation, uh, but something that if it gets um, on the ballot, council certainly could decide to weigh in on. Uh, the next one is allowing uh, permanent rental um, requirements to be um, included in our inclusionary housing um, measure. Um, this bill has not yet been introduced. I've received promises that it will be introduced this week. Um, it quite simply says um, that the inclusion of rental housing, permanently uh, rental, uh, sorry, uh, excuse me, uh, rental property in an inclusionary zoning is not a violation of the, uh, the prohibition on rent control. So it makes that very clear. Um, then there is the prohibition on driving with a mobile electronic device unless it is hands-free. That is, that has passed the Senate. That's great news, and it's on the way to the House. Um, the committee, and I think all of you have raised some questions, which I think are great ones. First of all, um, as you know, this failed last year because of the concerns that it would provide a, an excuse for racial profiling. 
But we did confirm that the way it's drafted, this would be a, um, a secondary offense, so they would have to find a primary offense to pull somebody over. That doesn't mean that opposition based on racial profiling is going to go away. I think um, there is concern that anything that provides an, an additional excuse uh, could be a concern. So that is one reason why this is not going to be an easy one. Another question that was asked was, well, what about people? Carl, we got a question for you here. Yes. Sorry, can I clarify on that? You said it was a secondary defense offense. Yeah. Does that mean if I'm driving, talking on the phone, if I'm not doing anything else wrong, they can't pull me over? Exactly. Cool. Thanks. Uh, the second thing is there was a concern about, well, isn't this kind of uh, discriminated against those who can't afford new cars that have built-in audio? Um, and the question more specifically was asked, well, can you put your phone on speaker? And the answer is yes, you can, and that would be legal. However, the moment you touched it, <laughs> you would technically be in violation. Um, so you would, of course, have to begin the call before you drove and not touch it again until you ended the call. So that's what technically would be required. So you, you would have that ability. Um, okay, so I think with that, I have covered all bicycles. I, I didn't mention bicycles nor any others that weren't directly related to the council priorities. So what I'm leaving out are ones that are in your in your memo that were not exactly things that you had asked for, but that are related. So what the mayor has brought up is that there's other bills that would help with our distracted driving zero uh, vision zero goal. Um, so happy to take questions about that. I also have uh, Taylor, Taylor Ryan in here who's worked on that, who can help us out with any questions. Um, moving on, I would like to talk about recommendations that were made or either made by myself, made by the committee, suggested by the mayor, and I have three of them. The first one has to do with, um, well, the first two have to do with transportation legislation. The committee was briefed on the fact that there is a bill, HB 1151, that would expand the authority for regional transportation improvements. There is already the ability of cities and counties to work together and create a regional transportation authority, essentially an IGA among all the governments. It's considered to be a big obstacle because every member of that group, assuming it's contiguous or regardless, would have to adopt a individual resolution that's identical. Um, as a way to simplify things and in recognition that a statewide solution for transportation dollars has been difficult to find, um, this bill would say that our MPO, in our case Dr. Cog, would have the ability to, through a vote of their board of directors, create an RTA, describe what the tax will be, describe what the money would be used for, but they would still have to refer to the voters. Now, unlike what would currently occur, each city and county would not have to pass it through a majority. It would be the looking at the entirety of all the cities and counties that make it up. If that vote was a above 50 percent, that would be that would constitute a passage of this measure. Um, so, this is a bill that um, the mayor and uh, Councilmember Brockett and others have had conversations with at the Metro Mayor's Caucus, at Coward Municipal League, at Dr. Cog, about the concern that we, as we know, are looking at the possibility of a county transportation tax. So we'd be hard pressed to be included in a metro-wide tax that may not lead to the projects that we want or perhaps in, to the sufficient investments that we need. So the recommendation that is being proposed for you is that we oppose this bill unless it's amended to allow cities or counties to opt out. Um, that's really at the core of it, because that way if we're outvoted at Dr. Cog, let's say Dr. Cog, you know, majority of them say let's create an RTA and we're on the losing side, we want to make sure that we have the ability to say no, Boulder chooses not to be in, in that there are also a couple of other ideas that could be additions to that, which is um, perhaps also saying that if, um, if we don't opt out, but our voters in Boulder do not support it by majority, that we should be effectively considered as, as, as having opted out 
Um, and then the last idea is to revise the language to clarify that CDOT and RTD could not use our additional investment in transportation to lower their commitment. Uh, that there's already language on that, but there's certainly an ability to clarify that. Um, so that is the number one recommendation. Again, that is uh, uh, HB 1151, and I know the mayor will, will have more to say on that. The second one has to do with Senate Bill 151. This one has to do with the administration of RTD. Um, as you'll recall, certainly the ones, uh, uh, those of you on council from last year, we have a measure, we have a position in the policy agenda that says we want greater governance and transparency and functioning of RTD. There's, there's challenges going there, going on there, and we need to uh, make sure that there is legislation or that there is oversight to help address that. Um, this bill attempts to do some of that. It certainly creates more transparency. Um, however, it does a couple things that are kind of not necessarily consistent with it. It creates an expansion of the board by adding two new appointees uh, appointed by the governor, one focus on riders with disabilities, one focus on equitable transportation planning, and then two ex officio members. Uh, one, uh, one would be for the treasurer and the, the other one would be for the executive director for CDOT. The reason this is antithetical to what we were asking for is last year we said let's make the board smaller and let's increase their ability to focus and perhaps to consider this as a full-time job. So this is moving in the opposite direction. So we certainly have had some, some concerns with that. The second thing is it also increases liability by basically mirroring what's in federal law in terms of the violations of uh, the Americans with Disability Act by saying that the uh, state law would also prohibit, prohibit that and uh, state courts could actually entertain such lawsuits. That's been a, a concern uh, by many, certainly by RTD, that this would create um, less money for RTD um, by increasing the, uh, the liability for them. So again, not exactly in alignment with what we had said in the policy agenda that we would support, which is greater governance, greater functioning. So the good news, this was heard today in Senate Transportation Energy Committee. It just completed about an hour ago. There were nine amendments made. There, there is no compilation of it. So I do not know for sure what was added. I know that one thing that they were going to add, and I'm pretty positive was added, is the creation of a blue ribbon panel of experts from the state and local and national level, level who would basically work to uh, do a diagnostic of RTD and make uh, recommendations on, on how to improve the functioning of the organization. It, they would also create an accountability committee which would, I think if it's for nine months, would work with RTD, and they would make recommendations. The RTD uh, executive director and the board would not have to take those recommendations, but if they chose not to, they'd have to explain why. These are the kinds of changes that would certainly fall in the category of greater governance and functioning and all that, so, uh, so that's very encouraging. However, because this bill is, uh, I don't have a amended version of it, I, you know, so it's hard to, to, to recommend anything for you right now. So the recommendation that I'd like to make, and again, the mayor, I'm sure, will weigh in on this, is that we have discretion to support it, this bill if it is amended to improve RTD's accountability, transparency, and general functioning, um, for example, through the Blue Ribbon Panel and the commission. Um, and avoid significant exposure to liability. I say significant because I don't know if you know, we should draw a hard line and say do not increase liability. And avoid expanding of the board. Um, so this is something that we're asking council to give us discretion so that we can read the bill. It's gonna be a subject of conversation, a continued subject of conversation at Dr. Cog, CML, Metro Mayor's Caucus, US 36 MCC. Um, so that, that is the second recommendation. Um, the, th the next topic has to do with process. Um, actually, no, I, I jumped the gun here. Um, the, the recommendation that was made in your memo on a packet page 334 is to make an, a change to the policy agenda to essentially allow us to support a, a bill that was introduced by Congressman Goose that would allow FEMA to uh, study 
in what situations it makes more sense for them to reimburse infrastructure that actually improves the resilience of projects. They have been hamstrung by requiring the same projects, same infrastructure that had just been devastated, and there's has led to, to a lot of ironic results and a lot of challenges for the city and the county. So we're very thankful for the congressman, and with this, this revision that's in your packet, um, uh, we'd be uh, formally in support of that and perhaps be able to convey that when we go to D.C. next week. The next recommendation is process. Um, as you remember, a mayor, uh, a pro tem, uh, Yates, had suggested that we r r take a fresh look at how we approve the uh, policy agenda. Um, I have sent on hotline some changes that I recommended, and I just realized I did not bring hard copies with me, but I can summarize them. Um, essentially, they would do three things. It would say the policy agenda has right now a purpose of the policy agenda. We would revise that to say uh, revisions and use, or I, sh I should say adoption and, re and use of the policy agenda. So it would clarify there for all councils in, per in perpetuity <clears throat> how you go about revising it. And the first recommendation that the committee has made is to, when you get a request for a change to the policy agenda, is to send that to your Intergovernmental Affairs Committee, where they could deliberate on the issue, the pros and cons, and be informed by a staff evaluation. Recognize that this is not always going to be the case, so there is language that allows council to do whatever they need to do. But as a matter of general practice, we think it'd be helpful for there to be a more uh, robust conversation beyond having to make a decision on the fly, um, especially ones that are, we often uh, start just entertaining during public hearing. So, th so that's recommendation number one on process. The second one is there was a concern um, by the committee that the positions are pretty overwhelming for new council members and that it's not fair to saddle them with having their very first meeting to understand these and to approve them. And the reason it's been that way is because up until then, I wanted to make sure that council had uh, an ownership. And by council, I meant the new council. But um, that has certainly created some challenges. And so the proposal is have it approved in these odd numbered years when we have new council members in October. And in fact, have it always approved in October. Um, in the odd numbered years, provide an opportunity for the new council members to uh, if they choose to serve on the Intergovernmental Affairs Committee to meet again in December so they can say, well, thank you very much, Press Council. We'd like to make some changes. And then to have an opportunity for Council in January to revisit uh, uh, the issue of whether there's any amendments to the policy agenda. So that was the uh, recommendation made by the committee. And again, the committee will, will want to <coughs> speak towards these issues. The last uh, proposal was a recognition that this is a very broad and long policy agenda, and it's somewhat, it may be unrealistic to expect that all of you are equally committed to all of the items. So while we ask that an adoption of the policy agenda indicates just that, that you support and you commit to supporting, when speaking on behalf of the city of all the policy positions, that you nonetheless, if you have reservations or certainly if you have an opposition that's personal, that it is appropriate to share that um, when you vote for the policy agenda. It actually, as Mayor Pro Tem Yates mentioned, it actually helps me to make sure that I'm aware of you know, what issues council is fully supportive of, what where there might be some concerns. It also helps me understand who maybe I turn to for, uh, for to testify at the Capitol. Um, so anyway, this is a recommendation made by the committee and I'll let others speak more towards it. Um, let's see. Uh, finally, in the process side, we do receive recommendations. We, we get requests for resolutions on legislative matters, on policy matters all the time. And by policy, I mean intergovernmental <coughs> policy. Um, this is often done because most people are used to cities that don't have a policy agenda. So they, thinking that the council doesn't have any other way to convey its support or opposition to a measure, had no choice but to adopt a resolution. So many times one of you will get a request, can you adopt a resolution in support of this bill or in opposition to, to this bill? Um, council, of course, continues to have that right. Sometimes it may be something that you really want to elevate and its importance. But as a matter of course, the committee is recommending that you instead use the policy agenda. 
um, and save council time and to have the, I guess to uh, protect the integrity of the policy agenda, have all your commitments on intergovernmental policy included in the policy agenda um, and everything that, that that involves. So that is the last recommendation um, on that. One other point, um, this came up because um, the mayor has been, as all of us who on, serve on intergovernmental committees are often asked to vote on bills that the city has not provided direction on. And so the question becomes, do we as representatives of the city just sit on our hands and recuse ourselves when we are often asked for our vote on many bills, or do we um, weigh in anyway? And what I had always advised um, the mayor and any other council member, which includes many of you here, who are in this position, is to, of course, if a position is consistent or in, you know, in opposition to our policy agenda, your responsibility is to vote for that. If there is no policy agenda position, then you have to decide, well, what my council like, likely think about this? You know, what do I know about my council? And, and it certainly would be in your interest to, to represent the council correctly. If it's an issue that council hasn't even wrestled with, but is nonetheless important or something that you're being asked to vote on, the past practice has been, well, your council has uh, delegated you as a representative to Rocky Flats, Stewardship Council, or Dr. Cog, or the MCC, or CML, and we'll see all these groups vote <coughs> bills all the time. So the past practice is, yes, um, make the recommendation that you think is appropriate and bring it to council, council's attention as soon as possible afterwards. Um, so this isn't really a recommendation so much as this is how it's been done in the past and something that recently came up when the mayor voted on a arbitration bill that some in the CML and Metro Mayor's Caucus bill felt like it was undoing the benefits of some construction defect reforms, uh, when in fact it had to do with consumer protections that our Senator Fenberg had been proposing. Uh, so he, uh, he, he blocked consensus at the Metro Mayor's Caucus, which can be done when you have five members or more that choose not to support a recommendation. So it's high profile and it's important for you to know it. Um, and I know that he checked in with many of you, if not all of you on this, because you know he didn't want to get ahead of council. But it's a perfect example why there should be a expectation by council for what is done in those situations. So this is just an opportunity to reaffirm informally that that's what your uh, representatives are doing. Finally, on uh, the issue of local encryption on radio communications by the police, I guess we're talking about scanners here. My understanding is that we don't currently encrypt. Uh, cities like Denver have chosen to encrypt. Um, the encryption can be done for a variety of reasons, perhaps to protect the uh, police officer, pro protect the victims, protect the um, people who called the police and maybe were having a mental health crisis and don't want to be stigmatized by something that was potentially embarrassing. Um, what I don't want to get into is a discussion of whether encryption is appropriate or not. The city police department has that issue that's, that's coming forward, and I believe they're, they're bringing it forward for council to consider. And if not, certainly council can always weigh in on it. The issue with this bill that has come up is HB 1282. It's not a question about whether cities should encrypt or shouldn't encrypt. It's a question of whether city councils should retain the right to make that decision. The state law would essentially say, if you encrypt, you need to create an encryption policy, and you have to make all those communications available to the media. It doesn't define what a media means, and I think these days you could imagine that media could be defined quite broadly. Uh, it also says that um, unless you have reasonable, um, uh, um, you can't imp uh, deny the public these communications if, um, unless you have an unreasonable, I'm sorry, I, I should just read my notes on this one. Um, standards that prevent governmental entity from imposing unreasonable and burdensome limitations on access to radi radio communications. My concern with that is who's to say what's unreasonable and burdensome. Again, this is essentially a preemption of local authority. Currently, we have that authority and this would take it away. Um, yeah, so that's all I have on that. And I guess I'll just reiterate that because being that it was a front page story, I, I can imagine some people being concerned about it. The question is not whether to encrypt or not. The question is,
by opposing this do we want to retain that decision here at the local level? And that is the only reason that we're opposing this. And of course, council could correct me if, uh, if that, and, and by the way, we do have a policy agenda position to protect our local control, but certainly council could choose to do otherwise. So that's all I have. Thank you for your time. And as I said, I'm available for questions along with Taylor. Any questions? Mary? So earlier this year, we had a request from um, several community members for a resolution on Medicare for all. And we, um, at least I responded to, to them saying that this seemed like an appropriate, um, like the state and legislative agenda seemed like an appropriate place for that request. And so um, how would we, since we punt it to here, mm -hmm. how would we address that? That's a good question in terms of the actual process. I would imagine that if any of you is interested in entertaining a request that you could let me know, and I would add as an agenda, agenda item to the Intergovernmental Affairs Committee, uh, you certainly could let any member that's on that committee know, <clears throat> um, or you could bring it forward. Well, so those are the two best ways, because that's a perfect example of something that's highly complex. And for us to consider opposing or supporting how it affects our community hospital, different opinions that exist on this, um, we would want to do some preparations and understand what the politics are, what the actual substantive impact is. So yeah, I guess, does, does that answer your question? Well, sort of. I mean, it, it, it tells me what the process would have been had it been in place when that request came. Right. Um, but we punted to address that particular request tonight. So... Can I, do you mind if I chime in, Mary? Please. Because uh, we did funnel that request to the legislative committee. Oh, I see. Right? So the, but the form that it ended up taking was uh, whether we would add support for a particular bill in, in, under consideration of the state legislature for a public option. And so, so that was how we understood the request. And Carl, do you want to give an update on why, why we declined to right. position uh, on that bill? And I apologize legislative. for not understanding, uh, Council Member Young. I, I thought you were using it as an example, just theoretically. Yes, that was actually an issue that was brought forward, I think, by Council Member Friend and maybe others. So we did discuss this at the committee. We had our lobbyist who has quite a bit of knowledge on this. Um, we ultimately, at least the committee, decided to not get involved at this point, that we needed more information, and that if anything, we would need to know whether our own community hospital, which is a nonprofit, I believe it's one of two, might... Well, Carl, do you want to take a step back and describe the bill? Because I think probably not everybody's familiar with Sure. It. Yeah, um, and Carl, Carl just, <clears throat> I'll interrupt the... the um, Movement that Mary's talking about was Medicare for All. So in okay. December, we got notebooks that said Medicare for All. So it's a specific federal policy that we received a request for. What we talked about at the legislative committee is a public option. Which is different from... It's different. Uh, yeah. That's what I'm, I'm making the distinction. Yes, right. they're, they're different things. And I don't know, Mary, that we ran the issue you're talking about to ground. I think, and that was what I meant, is that somehow that request got funneled into whether or not we should support this particular bill, and that was the scope of what we ended up talking about, not the larger question of Medicare for all. Well, so the question would then be, is there something, based on what you all described here tonight, is there anything um, on the table with respect to Medicare for all? And if there isn't, then that request is moot, as I understand it from the process described. Is that well, we should that probably revisit it, Mary. I don't think we we addressed it head on in the format that the um, folks requested. However, wh what I would ask is, what do we have as far as federal policy suggestions for medical right now? Didn't we support, for instance, Obamacare? Um, we we didn't take any position on federal health. No. Issues. Um, health issues, perhaps more broadly, but certainly not health care uh, or insurance or anything like that. So let me ask, do we currently have anything in the legislative agenda that would um, address such a request? Uh, no. No, that would be one that I would certainly be interested in hearing um, council's interest in and, again, having um, an intergovernmental affairs committee discussion on. So maybe that's that's the ask is to consider yeah. um, 
an addition of uh, health-related policies. Adam? If I remember their request, um, it was specifically for our city council to pass a resolution. It didn't have anything to do with trying to combine it with any state level mm -hmm. issues. It was just about us. So we can do, definitely do something, try to do something at the state level, but that specific request from that group is just about us. Right, right. And so, I mean, I think it brought up the, the existential discussion around resolutions of what should get funneled into the policy agenda discussion so it takes a place there, which is more permanent maybe than a resolution because it can be crafted every year, or what like um, Rachel just brought forward and the folks who are here about immigration is being responsive to changing conditions on the ground, right? And so we, I don't think we came up with a crisp definition for when we would try and funnel something into the, because we have policy positions on immigration right now that are in the agenda, but this is a request to respond to changes that have occurred since we put that in the agenda. If that makes any sense, having you know the the ICE teams getting no, support. No, the immigration one. Yeah, I understand the. So, so the Medicare for all one. So, when's our next meeting, Carl? We are looking to schedule one for for May. So, how about if we make sure to bookmark that one specifically for May and have the legislative committee either say we want to do a federal <clears throat> health care policy position or we don't, and then we just have to address that request on council. I think that's... And I, and I think on something like that, I, I don't know if there's a federal bill pending or not, but I, it would be nice to be able to target a specific bill as opposed to a general statement of policy. I mean, I know that their legislative agenda has some general ph philosophical statements, I suppose I could call them, but to the extent that there's a specific bill that folks want us to take a position on, that staff can study, um, that would be helpful as opposed to just a general philosophy that healthcare is a good thing. Rich. To muddy the water a little bit more on that one, as I recall, the um, constituents really wanted a resolution because they were asking a lot of other city councils for resolutions, and so they wanted to be able to add us to the list of cities um, that have signed the exact same language. So I think that might be a little bit different than the usual ask because it's we, we get that ask okay. all the time, just okay. FYI. Um, you'll see lots of those where there are form resolutions yep. that have been passed by many cities. And so, again, I think the struggle is when do we elevate something to council discusses it and takes our time, and when do we punt something to the subcommittee and hope that it becomes kind of a long-lived agenda item. So, so the proposal was if we take that one up in May, and come to a resolution on whether we want to take a position or not. It, to me, it seems like if we don't take a position, it should come back to council and we decide what we want to do with the resolution request. If we do take a position that ends up in the legislative agenda, then from then on, we just refer people to the legislative agenda. Okay. Okay. Shall we, any other questions for Carl? So I do have some words to say, but I'll wait till after the public hearing about the particular bills. So shall we open public hearing? Do we have anyone signed up? I'm not signed up tonight. Yeah, you can come speak and then sign up afterwards. Hi, uh, I'm Carolyn Beninsky. I'm with the Rocky Mountain Peace and Justice Center, and this is the first time I've been here since the new council, so hello. Thank you, Carl, for your update. It's very informative. I wanted to just uh, briefly say that um, we've always, the Peace Center has always supported mobile home tenants and um, glad, the, the city has too, and so thank you for that, and we support strengthening their rights. Um, regarding pesticide use, uh, the Peace Center is part of a coalition called the Organic Land and Food Coalition, and we support uh, the exemption, um, I mean, we support uh, removing um, state exemption and allowing cities to just decide this. Boulder actually has been very good under the leadership of Rella Abernathy in regard to these issues. So, uh, you know, we'd like a stronger bill, but this is a first step to, um, to at least being able to regulate homeowners' use of uh, pesticides so that we're not being 
the, this, this stuff isn't drifting into our homes, into our children's lungs, and on our lungs also. So it's not, you know, it's not everything, but it's a good start. Uh, this is on a personal level, driving with a mobile phone seems like a really bad idea, and uh, I was interested to hear that this bill would not allow for any um, enforcement unless someone was doing something else, and I, I just, this is personal, we haven't discussed this, but it is something worth looking at, uh, you know, why wouldn't you, why would you have a law if you're not going to enforce it? What's the use? Uh, I wanted to just say that uh, in regard to weighing in on bills, you know, you mentioned with the mayor being able to weigh in on bills. I think it's really important to uh, really have full knowledge of what's in a bill because sometimes you think it's one thing and it turns out to be something else. That happened with the regulation of small cells that was basically allowed these small cell towers to be uh, to be preempted basically by the big telecoms and local governments have no rights now. And most of our, our local, our uh, state legislators had no idea of what was in the bill. So I think you really have to know what's in it. I've got 28 seconds. Um, I wanted to say also that uh, Confidence in government is at an all-time low. I'm not saying for the city of Boulder, but just in general, you know, in, the, in these polls that are shown. So it's really important, I think, for the city to be as transparent as possible, to uh, allow citizens to weigh in on issues so that uh, you know what people are really thinking and they feel represented. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Mm -hmm. Anyone else want to speak? Okay, with that, we will close public comment, bring it back to council. <clears throat> if it's okay, I'd just like to give a teeny bit of color to the Metro Mayor's Caucus <clears throat> situation. Um, the legislative committee folks have heard this, but the, the issue with 1151, which is generally, I think, a good bill, it's gonna give taxing authority to Dr. Cog if a few conditions are met, which include a vote of the people within the footprint. Our concern among a number of mayors in the northwestern region who have been unhappy with the stadium district vote when Boulder did not support the stadium district, but we had to pay taxes into it in any case, and the um, <clears throat> RTD fast tracks, and we know what's happened with that. You know, we've, we've received a lot less of our money than we paid in. So a group of us have been going to these meetings and speaking about wanting an opt-out provision. And the opt-out provision isn't so much because we want to use it and opt-out, because we would really like to be part of these regional solutions, but it gives everyone a seat at the table to really say, look, if we don't get the transportation, regional transportation projects that we need to connect us to Brighton or us to Longmont or whatever, then we're gonna opt out, and so we, Dr. Cog will then have to pay close attention when they design the programs, which they're gonna take out and ask for the taxes for. So it really is more of a leverage thing than a desire not to participate. Um, and it, the, the feeling of concern is shared among Louisville and Lafayette and Longmont as well. So that's all been part of the discussion about what will it take to get you guys to be on board with something like 1151. 1151 itself may not pass all the way through. I think the first committee hearing was today, in fact, on it, or at least it had previously been scheduled for March 3rd. Yeah, it hasn't occurred yet. Okay, in, in any case, some people are still lobbying for a statewide solution to the transportation problems. And so it's unclear if this is some leverage or what's gonna happen with it. I have been taking those positions without weighing in with all of council. In other words, saying we want an opt out, we want leverage, we want a seat at the table, and we don't want to have what happened in the past happen to us. So I guess one thing I would ask is if you have, if any of you have any concerns with me taking that position, let me know now because for the rest of the session, there will be more communication with the Metro Mayor's Caucus. Do you want to talk about Dr. Cog relative to this? Sure, thanks for that, Sam. Yeah, and, and, the, and myself and um, my Boulder County colleagues at Dr. Cog are, have taken a similar position, you know, about uh, that we should have the opt-out provision if we're going to support that bill. 
um, for the reasons that, that you state. So, and Dr. Cock itself is kind of queasy enough about the whole idea that it's only monitoring the bill, not supporting it, right? So uh, it's a little unclear whether it would whether it ever come to pass, but I think that opt-out provision is important. I did hear, Carl, you mentioned something about like, well, if our voters didn't pass it, we would automatically get opted out. It, which sounded like less of a good idea because if, if only the jurisdictions that voted more than 50% went for it, you had get this whole patchwork. Right. Um, so, so to clarify, the recommendation that I was making is that we oppose this bill unless it's amended to have an opt-out provision. Those other two examples of way or are ways that we could also address it perhaps, um, but there weren't ones that I was recommending, but I, I guess I threw them out there for, for all of you to determine whether you wanted to add that to your to your, uh, your motion. Well, I, I guess I would really like us to stick with a, an, an opt-out that we decide to do rather than a, like a 50% threshold for any jurisdiction to stay in. So that, that does not sound like the best approach to me, but I think it is really important for us to be able to opt out. Okay, good. <clears throat> so the only other idea that got floated frequently enough that Dr. Cog responded was <clears throat> the possibility of saying in the statute, 1151, how funds would have to be distributed. So if an MPO that had six counties in it, for example, um, <clears throat> were to vote to tax itself, then you could say it's like the TIP funding where 75% of the funding returns to the counties for them to decide what to do with, and 25% stays in a regional pot that Dr. Cog could use. And Dr. Cog didn't like it. Many, many other people didn't like having that in statute because it ties your hands when you go to design the program. So if you guys are okay, I think Aaron and I will continue to lobby for the opt-out. Okay, sure. super. 151, I'll just pass on. Um, we had one of the um, board of directors for um, RTD come to the Metro Mayor's Caucus meeting and talk about their um, uh, compliance with ADA requirements, talk about you know how RTD had been one of the first transit agencies in the country to really <laughs> pioneer this, and then to argue strongly against adding- Correction, they were forced to pioneer it. <laughs> yeah, could be. Yeah, that's not the way they said it. <laughs> uh, and so it, it really does seem at the end of the day like increasing liability is a bad idea, adding board members bad idea, you know, it, it all goes in the wrong direction. So I, I would say that having listened to people who know more about this talk deeply about it, it seems like support unless, I mean, oppose unless amended and who knows if the amendments were right, the nine that were done today. And actually for this one, the recommendation was, um, Support it if amended. If okay, support if amended. Yeah. Okay, because it, it, everyone says it's got a lot of good stuff in it. That there's a lot of kind of RTD process reform that is positive, but that it's got a few errors. So if you guys are, and we've been asked to weigh in on this, so if you're okay, I'm just going to accept Carl's guidance. Okay, what was the third thing? Oh, that should be easy. Supporting Joe's idea to let us rebuild bridges that are more resilient than the ones that were wiped out. <coughs> and then, and then process, right? That was the next thing <clears throat> that we were to talk about. So, um, you know, I did, I, I did oppose the um, Metro Mayor's Caucus opposing the arbitration bill. And I won't tell you about the details about why and so on, but we were able to successfully gather six mayors um, to oppose that and to try and get them oriented to what it was. But I did that, I did call folks and check in on the legislative committee, but fundamentally it didn't get all of council's formal blessing but just to Carl's point about process, it's, I'm pretty sure I knew where council was gonna be on this and I checked in with some members of the legislative committee. Sometimes we have to move pretty quickly. There would have been no way to poll council as a whole because we had less than a week to respond. So 
I guess the question relative to me and Aaron in particular during these legislative sessions is, are you comfortable with us making calls when we don't have time to come to council? This is just a time to say no if you have a problem. Okay, super. Carl, I think I'm missing one. What am I missing? Uh, we talk about the resolutions. Um, with that, I think that's it. Okay. So do we need a motion on this one, Carl? Ideally, I, I'd actually like to capture those positions uh, about RTD and the uh, Dr. Cog in the uh, agenda. So perhaps th the motion could include what was already in your packet, staff's recommendation, with the addition of the recommendations on the RTD and the Dr. Cog bill as presented tonight, as well as the process items that the, rec that the uh, committee has created. Okay. Somebody would like to make that motion? So moved. Second. Okay. And this is just a show of hands, right, Lynette? Okay. All in favor? Any opposed? Carl, thank you. It was a good presentation. Anything else you need from us? Nope. Thank you. Thanks. Your next item is the online petitioning update. <laughs> it's okay. I'd rather have it that way. <clears throat> it's not like we're not touching all the substantive issues. There we go. So. May I go ahead? Yeah, please. Okay, I'll be presenting on this. So, uh, <clears throat> this is the purpose for this agenda is, to, is one, a continuing process of providing council with an update regarding online petitioning and seek some direction on some of the decisions staff has made. Regarding online petitioning, I also have a short demonstration of where we are in the project. So um, I want to start off by explaining a little bit about why we think there'll be more petitions coming up. Um, j just so that everybody's on the same team, there are three different types of petitions that our charter allows. Uh, initiatives, referenda, and recall petitions. Uh, initiatives uh, are the ability of the people to, dr to draft laws themselves. Um, re referendum allows the people to, uh, re to overturn a decision by council to pass an ordinance. And recall is the ability of the people to recall an elected official, a council member. Um, so in, in the charter amendments that were made in 2018, the numbers for all of these changed. And as you can see in that third column, the previous numbers uh, for each differed, uh, and they were based on different things. And so we had a working group that recommended, and council adopted that recommendation, that the voters be asked to change them to be consistent. So now all of them are based on 10% of the average number of registered voters in the cities who voted in the previous two municipal candidate elections. So it, based on the last two when this was prepared, so we don't have 2019 in here, this is 2017, 2015, the number for each of those would be 3,066. Which, res which represents a reduction from in the initiative number, which was 4,166, the referendum number, which was 8,332, and the recall number, which was 12,257. So uh, because it will, we'll have smaller numbers, we expect- Tom, question. Sure. Sorry to interrupt. Of course. I, I just could have sworn we left the recall number as higher than the other numbers, right? I mean, that, that there was some d discussion about it. I, but I, I, could, I could be completely wrong. I, I'll go back and double check. I, I'm pretty sure that okay. we left it at yeah. either double or 50% more. Yeah, I think it was originally proposed at 10%, and then at the last minute, we changed it to either 20 or 25%. Something like that. Yeah. yeah. And so. I apologize. I did not go back and check. I went from the, the, the memo that was presented to you. No, we, we, we changed that. Yeah. yeah. Thanks. So, uh, process. So, the, the working group was created by council on December of 2017. Um, 2018, <clears throat> council approved measure 2G for the November ballot, which, which authorized online petitioning. And there were other ballot measures that authorized <coughs> the other changes. And on November 6, 2018, uh, the ballot measure 2G passed. Um, so on December 11th, 2018, we had a study session where we presented a work plan to implement what was called e-sign. 
uh, and then follow through with electronic petitions. eSign is the system that Denver uses. Denver has an electronic petition signing system that, that uses an iPad. They still use uh, signature, signature gatherers who will present the voter with, the, the, the registered voter, with uh, a petition on an iPad, just like you would currently present somebody with a piece of paper. The advantage to that system is it's hooked directly into the voter registration records, so the, uh, the <coughs> petition gatherer can verify that the person is authorized to sign right there without having to go back and check a signature. They put in the information, it checks against the voter database, and they, they, they sign right there. Um, so that was the original plan. Uh, so staff proceeded with that plan and presented first reading of an ordinance on February 19th and second reading of an ordinance on March 5th. Between December 11th and March 5th, the clerk in Denver changed. And when we first approached this, Denver was very anxious to sell their system, which they had developed in-house. Uh, the new clerk was less interested in selling their system, and they, they had other priorities at the time and decided to back away from that. So council decided not to pass the ordinance to authorize us to go forward with e-sign, but to direct staff to go straight to full online petitioning. So that was on March 5th. On April 23rd, uh, we presented a, a Per, the staff presented a proposal for a request for proposal process, and the, the, the quote I have there is from the council minutes, that, which is a recognition that we're going to work on this. It might we're going to try to get ready for April 2020. If not, it would be 2021. So. Um, um, we've got, we got a proposal from a company called Maplight. Maplight is a not-for-profit corporation interested in voter transparency and, and uh, more direct democracy. They are funded by a grant from uh, an individual who is very interested in direct democracy. Um, they offered a free open source system. Uh, staff decided to proceed with procurement as planned and invited Maplight to participate. The reason for this decision was to be able to compare MapLite's proposals with other proposals that were out there. This is an important thing for the city to do. There are all sorts of issues that we'd have to, we will ultimately have to address here, and we wanted to uh, sort of get out there in the community and see what what um, what might be available, and and also to allow to invite MapLite to participate in the process, and they did. So on July 8th, we issued the RFP. We had nine companies uh, that submitted proposals. Three were selected as finalists. Uh, one was Maplite, another was Runback. Uh, uh, there was a third company whose name I don't recall. I was not involved in any of the decision-making process in the RFP. It was the clerk's office and the staff of the Department of Innovation and Technology. Uh, on, so we, the Runback Election Services was selected as a final, as the prime, as, as the final, uh, as the selectee. Um, the, 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 the primary reason for that was Runback has experience running election software around the country, relationship with secretaries of state around the country, including Colorado's secretary of state. They have more of a proven track record in doing this than Maplight did. Maplight seems to be a very good company, and they are very smart at what they do. Runback seemed to be the better choice for what we were doing. So uh, the contract was negotiation started after we selected them sometime in um, September, and we, we concluded the contract negotiations in December. Um, it took a longer time than I would have hoped. This is not uncommon in IT procurement. IT companies tend to take a very hard line in altering their contracts, and a lot of them do not have experience, although Runback does, in dealing with governments, particularly in governments in Colorado, that have restrictions on what we can do. For example, we cannot agree to a clause that says we'll be governed by the law of California. Um, that we, we cannot agree to a clause that requires us to indemnify them. Uh, but those are very common clauses in IT contracts. So we, we, we spent some time negotiating it. We got it right. At the same time, we have been working to get data from the, um, the county and the Secretary of State, and I'll, I'll provide more information on that in a second. This is a picture of Lynette's dog. <laughs> That's Hank. Um, when I said I was going to put a put, uh, puppy in, Lynette said put Hank in. So, <laughs> so the RFP called for a robust, secure, and easy system for, for electronic petitioning. We required two-factor identification using a telephone number. We did not re require a system that would allow paper and electronic petitioning at the same time, and we did not require open, an open source system. You've heard a lot about open source system, and I'll talk about that in the next slide here. Uh, what an open source system is, it's, it, it's the developer makes the source code available to other developers and users without charge. So an open source, open source software can be updated and changed. Um, generally, the, the software provider does not provide ongoing support for the product. 
this was important to the city, but we did not make a choice based on open source or proprietary. In the proprietary system, the source code <coughs> is owed by the developer, and then they can make money by selling it to other people. They are interested, more interested in providing ongoing support, um, and they, our contract with Runback provides for uh, annual support services and maintenance of the program. So paper and electronic. So the, the st staff recommended against, we did not ask for a system that will handle both at the same time. And you've got to understand, so, so the, 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 the workflow that would be required to handle both at the same time would be you'd have an online system for, for, for handling petitions, and at the same time people would be out gathering paper signatures. You'd have to figure a way to deduplicate the signatures, which we do now by hand, although the, the challenge, one of the basic challenges we've had, in the last 10 years, we have only had four successful petitions. So we do not have a lot of these in our history. If we get a lot, we don't know how to staff for this, whether we're gonna get one or 10 next year. And because we've lowered the numbers, it's more likely we will see more than we have in the past, which is fine, it just presents challenges for staffing. So the system that we have asked to be designed will only process electronic signatures. If someone wants to do a paper petition, they can still do that, they just will not be able to also get signatures online. Um, we're not clear if there would be a demand to have both. The additional cost uh, in the absence of a demand is hard to justify. So my recommendation would be, Let's get this implemented. If, there, if it seems to be a barrier not having that extra ability to gather paper signatures, um, then we can try to, we can, we can ask Runback to add that capability. We'd also have to add staffing because the verification of paper petitions has to be done by hand, obviously. And then you have to figure, you have to have a system that, 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 um, that on an ongoing basis provides you an update of the signatures, that, that the endorsements that are rec received online. Um, so our recommendation is to go ahead with one, with just the one uh, exclusively. So Steve Pomerantz has made a couple of recommendations that, that so one of which we had considered, one we had not talked about. What, what, so uh, as you'll see when I demonstrate this, that the, we, one of the things we've required is two-factor uh, authentication, which is a very common process. You know, if you get if you want to access your bank account online, you generally have to give them a phone number and email address that's tied that's already that they already have. They send you a code that you then enter. The, the, a similar thing would be done here. Uh, the, what Steve has suggested that we use postcards as an alternative. That is, use a, a postcard that would be sent to the mailing address in the voter registration database that would have the code on it. And then the person would then go back in and enter the code after they receive the postcard. A uh, couple of challenges with that, uh, someone has to mail those postcards, receive the ones back that uh, bounce from the address and some will, um, and, and the postcard itself would be in a mailbox which isn't very secure, so someone could theoretically get in. Um, it's possible to do it. Uh, we pr the pr system we've proposed is a little bit more streamlined and we think more effective. Um, Steve has also recommended that we, you, that we have a sort of mock purchase, that, that someone could, could enter a credit card uh, for a, a, like 10 cents and we would use the credit card information to authenticate that person lived at that address. Um, the challenge is that the, the credit cards are not in the election data, so it's a separate source. Um, also, there are regulations about storing credit card information that are pretty significant, and the city does it in a lot of things. We'd have to overlay that into this, and so staff does not recommend that as an alternative. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about the voter registration information. So the Secretary of State has the voter information for, information for the state. They provide that to the counties. The county clerk and recorder is the keeper of that. The Secretary of State has never provided that information to a city. You've heard that Denver has that information. Denver is, of course, a county. So that's why Denver has it and Boulder does not. Boulder County has it. Um, we have heard from council members who've spoken with uh, the Secretary of State that she does have concerns about security and about wh where this is leading. And so uh, she, their, their direction has that the city has, should work with the county. Uh, the county clerk and recorder also has expressed some concerns to us, but they are they have offered us an, an MOU to get the data that we need. We are finalizing that. We've been to, through two drafts. I expect that to be finalized shortly. So we should, we will have, I'm confident we will have the data from the, that we need from the county when uh, we finalize this process. So why not just accept MapLite's offer? Now, I should make it clear, MapLite has made several offers. They made their original offer back in, I think it was May, 
and then they, they responded to the RFP uh, with an offer for about the same, about $250,000, about the same that uh, Runback's offer was. Yes, Mary. Quick question. I was a little confused in the memo about that because the memo said you issued the RFP and then um, it said MapLight didn't respond no. and then they s then it said that there was a, a, a meeting with MapLight or a, a conversation. So I was just, it did say it. It did, it's, I hope that it said it did respond. They did. They re did respond. Yes, they were part of the RFP process and they were a finalist. Because there was, in earlier in the memo it says that they did not respond to the RFP. I so. hope that doesn't say that, but I'm sorry if it says that. I'll, I'll look it up, because I, yeah. Well, if, regardless of what it says in the memo, that's not true. They did respond to the, memo, to the RFP, and they were a finalist. Uh, so so they, they made the, the first offer for a free system, the second offer for a system for about $250,000, and then they made a third offer after we closed the RFP. Now, when we closed the RFP, oh, Mary, the thing where they said we said they didn't respond, we asked for feedback on the RFP from the people who, and they didn't give us any feedback. So we did not hear from them that they, that they were gonna make another offer in, as part of the process. That might have been it. Yeah. They then came in later, after conversation with the community, with a, another free offer for a stripped down system that was different than the one that we had laid out in the RFP. It had fewer back end, uh, back end systems to allow the clerk's area to be mechanized. There were a lot of the more, as I read their, their second, the third proposal, it was for more of a stripped down system. Um, I also have a concern. We have heard from community members who have been contacted by MapLight or have contacted MapLight that they should direct counsel to circumvent the RFP process and award this to, to, to MapLight. That would be undermining the process that we went through. We don't generally allow unsuccessful proposers to come in and make a second offer and then work the political process to get the contract awarded. Uh, if Runback isn't the, the right vendor, if you want to do something completely different, we should issue another RFP and give everybody a chance to do it. Uh, we think RF Runback is the right person to do this. I th we think they're doing a good job. Um, I, we think the criticisms that, that we have heard aren't based on any, on a re on any, any reality. Uh, and I, as again, I'm concerned about this, the lobbying that's gone on to try to go around a procurement process, which would put us in a very difficult position. Tom, can you yeah, come Mark. up? In a proprietary scenario, um, what is the term that we're leasing the software for? Uh, this is uh, Vani Kata, who is the Vani, uh, project manager. Uh, would you want to just go up there and introduce sure. yourself and uh, see if you can what's answer the, the question? question? What, what's the term? For, what's the term of the question? Is, can you tell us your name really quick? Vani, tell us your name. Pardon? Your, your name, please. Oh, Vani with a V. V. Kata. I'm in IT, C-O-B-I-T. Okay. My question was, um, what is the term that we're leasing the software for, and are we at jeopardy after whatever that term is, six years, ten years, of having the provider uh, basically say that, that if you want to release it for further use, uh, the rates are tripled? Um, we are, aft after um, the development cycle, which will be this year, mm -hmm. um, then we're leasing it for four years. That's what we have on contract right now. And after four years, we're subject to whatever the, the market requests will be of, of, uh, of the vendor. The expectation is that we can keep renewing it if we're happy with the system. And, and Tom, for you, the question was, um, are the relationships of uh, vendors important if the Secretary of State is not going to give us the data? No, it's less important. Okay. All right. It's more the experience with collection systems that we liked. But that, that was a factor when we were, we were hoping to be able to get it from the Secretary of State. Okay. Thank so you. I want to talk a little bit about Arizona. Um, Arizona is a statewide system. Of course, it has access to, as a state to the vehicle and voter registration records already. They don't need to get it. Um, the residents are identified through their voter registration number, driver's license, or state non-driver's identification. They, uh, we spoke with Arizona. They. It, urged us to do rigorous testing before implementation. They told us the system can't fail once it's implemented, and they recommended two years from start to finish for uh, implementation and testing. 
Uh, they did not offer or were not interested in selling us their system. Their system is not for online petitions, for, uh, for ordinances or laws. It, it is only for the signatures required to get candidates on the ballot. And then I want to, can we switch, Debbie, to this one now? I want to show you where we are on the system. This is what the website will look like once it's up and running. As you can see, so, so you, I just want to point out some facts. <laughs> it, sa it says log in here. Yeah, they made these up. So it says log in up here. No mimes. And, and, um, but you will not need to log in to see the initiative. So if I wanted to see all dogs must be on leashes, I can read it. Uh, so anybody will be able to go on and read the various petitions. If I want to endorse the petition, I will be required to sign in. And so this, this will prompt me. And so this is already filled in. So I have I put in all my information. Click Next. It, I, it, it tells me I can either get a phone call or a text message with the phone number that is in the, the database for the, the Boulder County and Recorder, uh, Boulder Clerk and Recorder. Uh, if I do not have a phone number in my records, uh, I will have to go in. It'll, it'll give you an error message that says, you do not have a phone number. Please go update your records. We're going to, we, the, the MOU with the county gives us daily updates for their data so that once, if someone goes in within basically 48 hours, they should be able to come in and, and, and get the uh, phone number. So request code. I would enter the code, submit it. And then it'll come and ask me for what, for, to verify my residential address. We've got most of the address blacked out. Uh, under the charter, uh, someone not only has to be registered to vote in Boulder, it has to be a valid residential address. So I click here to say, yeah, that's my address. If it's not my address, it'll kick me out and say, you have to update your address with the, the county. Um, and then I, I'll, I have to certify that this is me, and it'll tell me that I've endorsed the petition. So going back to that first page, sorry. Ah, sorry, I messed it up. You'll see there's several th other things going on here, uh, and I'm, I'm sorry that. <laughs> We're less than several. That's the reason why it went away. <laughs> yeah. Well, the petitions will tell anybody who looks, you may have seen when you look, how many, sig how many endorsements are already there and how many are needed, whether it's open or not. So if, if a petition has a sufficient number of signatures, we will close endorsements. And so it, it'll say it's sufficient. Uh, there's also a, a, an ability for the clerk to, that's the other one, to lock um, out a petition signature. So if there's been someone, if, if there's a suspicion that someone's tinkering with the system, um, if we get a lot of uh, signatures from the same IP address on the same day, then the clerk will, will have the ability to lock it temporarily to investigate and then reopen it. So on the screen that I was showing you that I, that's not up there right now for some reason, let me just try this. I'm going to unplug and replug. Let's see if it, there it goes. Um, you can see that th this one I've highlighted is closed because it has enough endorsements. This one is locked uh, for investigation. Um, this was closed because the time period ended and it didn't get enough signatures. This one has enough. This one uh, is would still be open. This one has enough. And so, yeah, did you have a question, Bob? No, can you continue? I'll, I'll right. ask him at the end. Well, I th think, can we switch back now? Thank you. Well, I do have a question before you leave this then. Too late. <laughs> well, I yeah, yeah, don't have to have them, you, you, Two things. Um, one, you said that <clears throat> once the number of, of, of signatures has been reached, it closes, but most people will overshoot that. Will it automatically stop it? I mean, you showed those numbers at 3,066. Will it stop it at 3,066, or can they collect more? That would be the plan. Uh, that we, could, we could always allow them to collect more. The reason people overshoot is the signatures are invalidated. In this system, sign there will be no signatures invalidated because the only way it gets that number is if the signature's already been validated. Well, yeah. Yeah, but we might think about it, maybe uh, allowing them a little bit of an overage. I could see a reason why, you know, there was an allegation of fraud or something like that. I, I'd hate to have a stop it right at the number and then find out one of them was in fact invalid and then. That certainly could be done. Okay. We can talk about what that overage should be. The, and the guy guess the question is, why stop at all? Why not, you know, I, I understand we, we stop for time, but why stop for a number? 
Is there any any limitation in the system? If you need 3,000, you get 30,000, so what? No, there's no reason. Okay. Um, the second is, I, th I think this house law has the capacity to unsign, and those if I sign a petition and then think about it, and the next day I decided to, I wanted to withdraw my signature, can I do that? I, I don't think so. I think we, yeah, Lynette's shaking her head. The reason for that was that you can't do that with paper. Okay. And is, well, I understand you can't do that with paper, but um, can't, d does our law allow you to not? You could certainly do that if you wanted to. So the, the law doesn't limit us one way or the other? No. That's a policy decision for That's us? That's a policy decision. Okay. And we're going to write a law to implement this, and we could allow that. Okay. It'll come back to you at some time in the future. Well, let's tee that up for, I, I don't know what the answer is, but we should talk about it, make an intentional decision on that. All right. Okay. Debbie, come back. So uh, those are my questions. Does council support staff's approach, and is there council interested in redoing the RFP process? Mm, okay. I have a question before we get into questions. Um, what are the current sunk costs if we were to pull out of runbacks? Uh, I, I don't know what the answer to that is. Do you know? I'm sorry, I'm so sorry, I didn't hear your question. What are the current sunk costs? So what do we have to pay oh, them they actually if we were to pull out? Us, yeah, they will probably be about 25000 They haven't invoiced us yet, though. They started working in December, but they have not invoiced yeah. us yet. They're supposed to be invoicing us per month, but they haven't. Uh, and our, co our contract require, has a 30-day cancellation clause, so we'd, we'd have to pay them for any work they did in the 30 days for, for, uh, after we gave them notice to cancel. And it's a monthly contract? It's a, it's a four-year contract, but it has a monthly <laughs> cancellation provision. Right, but we're paying monthly. Well, it's supposed in, to be, yeah, but it sounds like they have an invoice. Correct. In, in exact increments, we're paying monthly. I just want to understand what our yep. potential liability, if we were to pull out, is. Yep. So I would say it's less than $100,000, probably in the $50,000 range, but it's hard to say. They've done an awful lot of work, so I, I'm so troubled we haven't seen the invoices yet. Real quick, checking out math, four years, yet $25,000 in... So, no, the, the $240,000 is for development. The contract for the... the there's a $40,000 okay. a year maintenance thing after that. But we're paying them monthly to develop. Yes. We're paying them monthly based on what they do in the development up to $240,000. Got it. Anybody else? Rachel? So I had a timing question. I think some of the um, concern from the community is, again, transparency. And if one of the slides, I think, said December 13th, there was a decision made to enter the contract. And I think I was at a meeting on the work group on December 14th. I want to say it was the very next day. And it was presented like, well, we already signed a contract. And I think there had been maybe some commitment to not sign a contract before meeting the work group. So I'd like some clarification on that. And also at that meeting, I don't think you were there, but it wasn't, um, like my sense was that, that the contract was long ago signed. So the fact that it was a day before, I think left some discomfort in the community members. Sure, I can explain that. Um, so we, we spent months negotiating the contract. And we also had, it, 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 I think it was maybe five days before, but I'm not exactly sure, because I think that meeting was the 18th, and I think we signed the contract on the 13th. So, but it was shortly before. So the question was, do we wait? And as staff, we have been criticized a lot on this project. If we waited and delayed the contract, we would be accused of delaying further. We reviewed the contract and said there's a 30-day out. If we, dis we hear something at the working group that we can't go forward, we'll, we'll just pull out of the contract. Delaying further would have just delayed things. We wanted to, we were trying to, at the same time we were meeting with the working group, we were trying to schedule our kickoff meeting with Runback to start this process. And at the time, we were still trying to make an April 1st date. So we were, we were already behind, and delaying signing the contract didn't seem like a wise choice and one that we could be criticized for if we didn't go ahead with it. So the fact that there was a 30 day out, uh, I advised Jane to go ahead and sign it. So that was not, I don't, I don't think that was an, Adam might remember this, I don't think there was any indication that there was a 30 day out when we, when we observed that meeting. So that would have been, I think, really helpful for the work group to have heard that we did just sign and we've got 30 days to look at it. Oh, so um, we, I, I was in on the planning of that meeting, that was supposed to be discussed, so I don't know whether it was or not, but I, I, as you say, I was not there. Not that I recall. Yeah. Sorry. Not that I recall. Yeah. But that, that was the, the rationale for signing it. Mm -hmm. Anyone else? <clears throat> okay, thank you. Um, 
<clears throat> so shall we address the questions? Does council support staff's approach? Adam? Oh, Aaron. Yeah, so I have a, a few things here, and I generally don't like going back on previous council's work, but in this case, we're not the, clearly not that far into it. Um, so three things I'll say here are um, the transparency piece I have concerns about. Um, I do like open source software in the sense that it is more transparent, and we're always trying to look for more transparency in this government. I worked for an open source company for eight years, and it is not a great way to make money, but it is a great way to be innovative and constantly improving. Um, in terms of leadership, our community, we're supposed to be leaders in the nation in certain things, and providing an open source means of uh, signing petitions that anyone could use, I think is absolutely worth considering um, again uh, with this council. And finally, the cost aspect, this is why I asked about the sunk costs. Obviously, I want, if a cheaper option is presented, I think it's also worth entertaining. Uh, it's unfortunate that we're already potentially 50 to to $100,000 into a different option, but um, again, what is the cost of leadership and transparency? Yeah. So, so those are the, those are the three things. Also, I'm not sure Runback's proposal, um, Maplight's proposal, is cheaper. Sure, because, because the, when you cut off the back end processing, you have to hire staff to do that. So, so, and that I'm just so, and stating we have not that. analyzed that because it came in after the RFP. We we so just yep. Yeah, and I'm not saying it is cheaper. I'm just saying there is still a potential out there. Yep. Okay. Those are my pieces. Aaron? Well, I, I do feel like we're on the right track here. I and mean, I think the, um, I think with something like this, right, which would be the first online petitioning system for um, ordinances or referenda, right, in, in the country, Arizona has something similar, but not exactly the same. I think um, anytime you're dealing with online systems and elections, you wanna be uh, careful, move slowly, and include lots of security. So the uh, two-factor authentication, I've heard some criticism about that, but as a software industry professional, um, that is definitely an industry standard, and I think it's important to include that level of security and to be, to be very, um, very careful about how we implement it. So I would have loved to have seen it uh, done for this year, uh, but I think uh, ha having it take a little bit longer, but doing it the right way with, again, plenty of security is is reasonable. And so I, and I, if it were open source, I think that'd be great. Um, but the fact that I think having the RFP based uh, primarily around the city of Boulder's needs was a reasonable thing to do. And so personally, I would not um, revisit that decision. Rachel? So I had a question. If we were to go back, what would that do to our timing? I assume right now we're best case scenario of 2021. If we were to restart the RFP, it, it seems like there's a lot of momentum and people want to do it now, and it looks like a great system that I would like to sign on for. So what, what would that do to timing? It's hard to say, Rachel. It, it, you'd hope that we could still make 2021. It would be hard. I mean, we'd be, we'd be basically going back to square one. It's March. If we drafted another RFP and could get it done in, say, 30 days, get it out by April, um, the, the tough thing is, is negotiating the contract with a successful vendor. Hopefully that could be done quicker. Um, you still then have to, in the RFP, we asked everybody for a timeline to get us to April 1st. But that, that depended on an October start date. And since we didn't get the contract signed until December, we did not have an October start date. It's possible that we would still be able to make 2021 if we, if we did, a, did a new process. Uh, there's no guarantees. I think it's much more likely that we'll make 2021 if we use the system we've got in place now. Um, and two more things. Um, if we did cancel this contract, does that impact sort of our credibility with negotiating with future partners? Sort of like we talked about with transportation, like when, when you have a reputation for turnover, is that at all similar here? You know, the way I'd phrase it is I think that we'd have a problem with our procurement process. Um, we do a lot of things like this. We do a lot of RFPs, and people count on the fact that when they, they make a proposal, the rules are set, they obey by the rules, and the, 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 we select the best vendor. 
um, to then have a different vendor come in by talking to the community and get a different RFP and maybe get selected, that would be challenging for us. Can I call a on that? Mm -hmm. um, but if the RFP was different, then it's a different RFP. So in that sense, yep. if, if we change our minds, then it's us changing our minds, not us doing the same exact thing over again. Yeah, just information gathering here. And then the, the last point I want to make is um, a little bit uncomfortable, but I noticed you had a slide up there and you mentioned Steve Pomerantz emailed us basically these things. And uh, as somebody who reached out to council quite a bit as a regular old nobody, um, you know, we don't get our own slides and I'm a little bit uncomfortable with ex council members and the equity issues that would be presented if there are, um, you know, considered to be sort of vaulted to that level. So I would just ask that we be um, considerate as a council and as staff that, um, no matter who you are, you know, we should be listening the same and, and uh, nobody should get sort of preferential treatment. I could not agree more. Thank you. Bob. I'm going to, um, first of all, defer to our IT experts on staff and on council and uh, support Aaron's position. I think I, I haven't heard a compelling reason to go backwards to to walk away from this fifty dollars to $100,000 to reopen the RFP process and to risk um, taking 2021 off the table. So I don't see any reason not to go forward. So I agree with Aaron. Mark. I'm like Bob, I'm a world renowned IT expert. <laughs> uh, but in this case, I also must defer. I, I'm just not sure what benefit we would be getting by starting this all over again. Um, and uh, I too support uh, Aaron's comment. Mayor Bay. I'll jump on that ship. Okay. Mary. Yeah, I, I concur with um, the path we're on and I agree with Aaron. One thing I, I do have a question about is the inability to have both paper and, um, and online um, signatures possible. So my question is, was there any consideration or, or has Denver completely taken off the table their e-sign process to be able to buy something like what, like that? What I'm thinking is that um, instead of having paper paper, you could have their iPad and have the signature gathering through iPads that would then be verified against the database. So you'd essentially have the iPad posing as paper, but would have the ability to instantly check. Um, and then check again, maybe just keep checking so that you're verifying, you're deduping um, as you go with the iPad. So, so um, Denver took that off the table because at the time they were in the middle of an election and they had a lot to do. So their, their election was in like April or May. You recall the mayoral election. So while we were talking to them, we're talking about this, they were, they were very busy. Mm. So we have not revisited after council took that off the table. It would require melding two systems. Under this proposal, people could still go to the library and sit down with someone and go through the petitions with them. I mean, it would be available on any computer accessing the internet. So there would still be an ability to do essentially that or to have, some, have a laptop of their own and do it. Um, and there's no reason why you couldn't do it on an iPad. I mean, it's, it's, mm -hmm. it, it's, it, so mm -hmm. someone could still use this system on an iPad and walk around and ask people to, to, to sign in there. Okay, well, that, that sounds reasonable. Yeah, I, I hadn't considered that mm -hmm. option. So, so I got three, I got um, Bob, Rachel, and Adam. And I was just gonna add to that, Mary, I, I, people obviously collect signatures all over the place, but I know one of the popular places to collect petition signatures is on the Pearl Street Mall. And of course we have free Wi-Fi. So I would think that, that somebody armed with the tablet and our free Wi-Fi in the mall would, would have access to be able to sign up through this system. Well, the, one of the things I love about this system is it'll give people the ability to actually read the petitions. 
uh, you know, when I, when I, I get asked for a signature, if I sign, if I, I don't, actually I'd make a practice of not signing, but if I were to sign, I generally don't have a chance to read about and think about or research the petition. And we've had instances in Boulder where uh, like an oil company was talking about how they're protecting the environment. Uh, if you, you can sell almost anything if you, with a three minute speech. The, the, the great thing about online petitioning, just like online voting, you can, when, you can sit there and research the petition and see and read it and think about it before you sign it. And I think ultimately when we get this implemented, it will improve our direct democracy by avoiding that. So I, I like to encourage people to take the time to do it. And I think that's, that's what's really neat about this, this new system. Yeah, so that's why I'd like to, when it comes back to Council for Nordens, I'd like to suggest that we give people the option to undo their signature because I, I'm concerned about a situation where somebody is talked into it on, on the mall, mm -hmm. goes home and, realize, and reads the petition for the first time, realizes, oh my God, what did I sign? Give people the opportunity to unsign. It's a policy decision from Council, we have said it yep. tonight, but I just want to throw that out there. Yeah, and I don't think that's a big heavy lift for run back to change, is it? Yeah, Bonnie's saying yes. Run back might disagree. Yeah, right. <laughs> we'll, we'll just do some uh, IT engineering from the dais. Rachel? Um, um, I'm probably going to disagree with Bob on that when the time comes because it seems like you can't change it on paper and it's it's going to be disoriented for counts and things if we allow people to undo it. So I'd probably just stick with it. Um, and then I, I do not favor going backwards um, or stalling this process, but I was so, and I am so concerned with um, just the murkiness of that meeting that was at, that I was at, and I don't think that we gave our work group the information that they needed to process um, the direction, and I wish that we would have uh, allowed them to have more input, um, so I, I would vote to go back and and reopen the RFP process. You Again, would or would not? I would vote to go back and reopen it for transparency and to allow the working group to do their work. So the, the working group ended. I, so we, we, we had that meeting as a courtesy to let them know where we were, uh, but we don't actually have an active working group on election matters. And that, that working group was formed for a different reason not to do this. this that was informational for them. Okay, uh, well, uh, the people who were there were, were I think, pretty um, interested in, in weighing in and giving direction and helping, and they were pretty informed on it, and, and especially just the, the, the timing of having just signed the contract and, and you know, the, work, the working group being said, we can't undo that, which is, I think, I'm, I'm fairly sure is what was said there, is, is just murky enough for me that that's why I would vote to redo it. Adam, and then Junie. Yeah, I had one quick question again, Tom, um, and I may need, sorry, uh, your help again. What are, are the ongoing costs after the initial um, delivery of the I think it's, there's a $40,000 a year maintenance contract. Okay, so it's not. That, is that correct? What are the licensing costs per annum? Per, per annum, yeah. Come up here. And please come up and. I'm so sorry, I don't remember off the top of my head. Okay. I, I thought, thought it was. It was 250K, and yeah. then I don't want to hazard a guess. Can you speak in the microphone Evan? just so I, I don't want to hazard a guess it, since you. I don't remember. But, but I can give you that information as soon as I looked at the contract. I can send it to Tom. So just to the point then, it's not like there's no ongoing cost. Well, there's definitely an ongoing cost. I, I remember at least a $40,000 year maintenance cost. Okay that we budgeted for. Okay, that was my question. Now I'm gonna say my little piece. Since I appear to be in a pretty small minority here, um, my only ask is that whoever's sitting here in four years, uh, look at the contract, see what success we've had, and since we don't intend to be leaders in the area of open source petitioning, maybe look and see if someone else has four years from now. Jenny. Hopefully four years from now, it will still be you sitting here. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, but I wanted to ask a few questions because going back to what Bob mentioned about undoing, and I'm thinking, I don't know too much about cybersecurity and encryption. I would like to know for me, it would be, if I can undo my own un petition, would that cause other problems? But I think the greater issue for me is the cost. And I think as well, just as it was said earlier, I think moving forward is very important. I wonder, 
even if we were to move forward, if there is an issue, can we go back and solve it rather than starting over again? To me, I think there's a big issue in starting over because I think it's, it's costing and it's time as well. Yeah, I, so we have committed to having regular updates to council and I gave you the dates that we did those. Um, we will continue to do that and we'll keep you apprised of where we are. I, I think that um, we, we plan to have uh, a functioning system uh, sometime like in June that we will begin testing. And so there has been a suggestion that we open it up to the community testing. I think that our IT security <laughs> folks are not happy with that idea and so we'll have to work through that um, because that exposes it to potential hacking when it, it's not final. So I, I think that's, the, but uh, we will have something for people to see by June. Um, and then w it is an iterative process as in any software development that you can do changes. There are costs associated with changes, which is why we've tried to keep folks informed of what we're doing. Just, uh -huh. just on that, I, Tom, having the initial testing be um, sort of internal to the city organization makes a lot of sense, but I would hope to have a period of community test use once it's finalized, but before yep. it goes live with the ab, you know actual petitions. So hopefully we could have a phase like mm -hmm. that. I think so, yes. Mm -hmm. Mary? Just um, on the issue of the open source versus the private, just to understand, make sure that I understand the ongoing costs. Um, with Runbeck, it's 40,000 is, is the stated um, annual cost. With open, then that would mean that if something goes wrong, you call Runbeck and you say, we're having this problem and they jump on it and they fix it. Yes. If you encounter something similar with open source software, what would happen? So we use open source software in the city and generally we have a contract with someone else who maintains it. So we, we, either our IT department does, which would, it would stretch them, or we, we have private vendors who will provide software support. So it's, it's doable, it's just not the vendor, it wouldn't be the, the developer who would do it. Yeah, so Red Hat, for instance, had a long time, they had their releases of Linux, but you could also hire them to do the maintenance and the support if you were a corporate entity that needed customization in some way. So, um, anybody else? Because I'm ready to weigh in. Um, if we want to get there. Um, I, I am not a software professional, however, I have run system, I've been a sysadmin for many, many, many different flavors of computer, including both open source and proprietary. And the most important thing really is that you have people maintaining whatever it is, right? You can have really lousy open source code where people have abandoned the project and what you've got is, is you know, something that got part way to where it was supposed to be. And then there's great open source code where you've got groups maintaining it and keeping it really well maintained. And so, you know, when I was having an exchange about this, I went and did some reading and there's links that talk about basically that. You need maintenance going on on the open source for it to be good. And so I don't, I don't think open source or non-open source is the critical thing. I think, are we gonna get what we want out of the, the software we're going to get? Um, and it seems to me, I mean, that demo looked nice enough and it seemed like there was enough flexibility in it. Um, and yeah, sure, for the first few years that we're using it, we're gonna wanna pay the maintenance contract because we do wanna have the ability to either alter things that aren't working or fix things that are broken or whatever. So I'm not particularly interested in going backwards on this. I do know there was a lot of uh, unhappiness by a few folks and you know, it's unfortunate if it was not as transparent as it could have been. But you know, RFP processes, once you launch them in the cities, that's kind of hands off for the council unless there's something really, really wrong. Um, and I don't see any sign that there's something really, really wrong here. I will make a comment about Steve Pomerantz. I mean, I think the reason he got highlighted is he gave some of the ideas that Tom was addressing, just like there were some ideas from other members of the election working group, and he was on the election working group and very deeply involved with that. So I, I feel like Tom did a good job of giving us all the kind of alternatives we've been hearing about and giving us a chance to speak to them. Um, and so, 
I am very hopeful that we will get there with this for 2021 and so people can use this. I think I'll weigh in on whether you should withdraw or not later, you know, because I'm not really set on that. I want to have some time to think about that. I will say that counting over the limit is something we should absolutely do. I don't know why there should be a cap, to be honest. I like if somebody gets 30,000 signatures when they need 3,000, it's going to speak to the popularity of the measure and stuff. So uh, I support staff's approach. I don't want to redo the RFP process. The only thing I could see that would make me want to redo it is if there was a majority on council who wanted open source, right? That that was a lay down on the tracks kind of thing. And then sure, we would go back then. But that wasn't a requirement of the contract. And I don't think that's what's going to make this successful or not. Um, when you can have open source, it's nice and good and positive, but to have it in an election system makes me kind of curious because if you would have open source that people could see, it would make it somewhat easier to hack potentially. So anyway, there's my part. Um, I, I, I do have the costing information. Okay, great, okay. thank you. For Ron Beck, it's 80,000 per annum. MapLite had proposed year one, it would be 58K, year two would be 60K, and year three would be 62K. So MapLite wasn't free after the initial build either. Okay. So uh, this is a matter, so we're just giving direction. <clears throat> um, it sounded to me like there were two members who would potentially be into redoing the RFP, but the balance were not into that. Um, so unless people have an objection, I'm going to say that we've kind of set our piece. And Tom, Jane, I think we're continuing forward with this. Thank you. We will move forward. I appreciate it. Great. Okay. Hey, uh, next you have a discussion regarding direction to the Charter Committee. Mary, would one member of the Charter Committee like to give us an update on where you are and what you're thinking? And you can, Mayor Bay, yeah. So Charter Committee actually met today, um, and the first discussion we had was uh, regarding how to split council pay. And so um, we thought we'd bring it back to council and have a discussion, but I think it was kind of between what's easiest for staff in terms of logistics, but basically taking um, and changing the charter to state that the total pay that council gets will be split into 26 and on occasion 27 payments because that's what happens per annum. Um, the other option was to have it paid once a month, but Rachel brought up that that might be uh, illegal uh, on a level, I'm not exactly sure why you can go over that, Rachel, um, or that it might be difficult for those relying on uh, the paycheck. And so we thought that it might just be best to stick with the um, every two weeks or 20, it ends up being about 26 paychecks per year. Um, and then we can get back into that. Let me just go over the three points. The second one uh, that we brought up was the number of board members. Uh, and because we had received a request from the Arts Commission that they add two more board members on, uh, that was a decently long discussion based on if we should add in other boards, but I think we settled on just uh, changing the charter to allow two more board members for the Arts Commission due to the workload that they have because they sit on a number of boards and some of the five member board, the five members currently, some are having to double up on the boards that they sit on. So um, we'd be adjusting that and leaving the other boards as is. And the final thing we discussed was whether or not to have people um, outside of Boulder with close ties be allowed to sit on our boards and commissions. And so uh, Mary and Rachel were more uh, open to that. I was not. However, I'm, it, I'd be interested in, like, if we were discussing gun barrel. I have neighbors who use Boulder and literally are on the street next to me that are in the county um, but can't be on a board because they're in the county. So maybe if we did it by a demographic for those who truly use Boulder. Um, Geographic. Thank you. <laughs> Geographic um, who, who truly use Boulder. Uh, I was open to that or possibly certain boards. Um, there was some concern for me, like on open space, I'm not interested in having someone who doesn't 
isn't a resident um, who didn't pay in with the taxes um, to be on a board, but Rachel brought up that people do still pay uh, uh, sales tax, but that for me is just not enough. So that was kind of some of the discussion. And then the final thing, Mary and I had discussed this last year while sitting on the Boards and Commission board, um, but it never kind of went anywhere. So this year, we, seeing as we're on the Charity Committee, we thought it would we'd bring it up again, um, of having one-year terms for students <coughs> I think eight, ages 16 to 18, uh, that would serve, you know, they wouldn't have voting rights, but it would allow them to be, um, get some civic responsibility, duties, um, experience, and um, maybe do it with a couple trials, especially I think the Arts Board would really be interested in having some younger voices and ideas. So just some thoughts, and we also thought TAB might be a cool one because, uh, Many of them may not have cars and the ability to drive, so it'd be interesting to hear their opinions on mobility. So that's kind of the wrap-up. Uh, you two can add anything you want. Nice recap by memory. <laughs> well done. Um, for the um, pay period issue, I just wanted to make sure now that we are um, getting health insurance and maybe categorized a little bit differently. I want to make sure that we don't fall under the category that, you know, employees have to be paid every 14 days or two weeks, I think. And so I just didn't know when that changed, if that, if we went to paying once a month or the way we're doing it now under the charter, is there any legal issue there under employment law? I don't know. I, yeah, I don't. It's I, an FMLA question. We'll have to look at it. Yeah. And a, yes, I, I think it might be Wage and Hours Act, but I, I don't know. Anyways, um, just something to look at before we decide to pay monthly. We don't want to yep. walk into something illegal. Um, and then, yeah, I would just add that I also, I, I brought this up um, at the retreat as well, but if we're expanding our boards and commissions outside of the city and our goal is to make them more diverse, I also think it's worth looking at, and I don't mean a quota here, but looking at other ways that we um, can be more intentional about diversification. I think we have some language in there that we try and, and have boards be gender neutral. Is that the word? No, gender balanced. Gender balanced, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> That's, That's bad. That's some right. verbs. <laughs> <laughs> not boards. <laughs> no, it's not even 10 yet. I have no excuse. Um, but anyways, just do we want to be more intentional and add some language in and, and be purposeful rather than or in addition to broadening our borders? Um, okay, so process question. Just not to shortcut you, Adam, I just want to make sure I understand what we're trying to do tonight. So um, I think what, so thanks for the report. And I think what you're asking, what the Charter Committee is asking us is, do you want us to, to ask you, the Charter Committee, to go out and study the stuff some more, work with staff, and then bring back some recommendations on the ballot? So we're not deciding any about measures tonight or the substantive you know, pros and cons of each one of these. It's just whether these are the right four things for the Charter Committee to focus on. Well, they're, I kind of, well, I guess the student thing, I kind of, is an additional thing. Okay, three right. or four, three and a half things. Uh, whether there's any more things we want you to do and whether these are the right things. So that's process. Are we all kind of cool on that? It's just <laughs> providing direction. Yeah, yeah I, I think we can take things off for sure so and we can give feedback to what we want to know so the way this stage usually goes is what you said except that i think if we know that you know seven people aren't interested in anything at all you just right. go ahead and take it off to, to avoid work that yep. is unproductive right. and and i don't know i mean we can add on of course but i think these were things that were discussed during um the retreat that we had all kind of more or less agreed to bring on to look at, so. Adam? Yeah, mine is a follow-up question about the employment status. Um, what is our employment status? Your, your employees. Are we contract worker? No, <laughs> your employees. We, it's, yeah. how do we not make a minimum wage then? <laughs> I, 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 act, I actually looked this up. There's actually a state law that says elected officials are exempted from the minimum wage. Oh. Thank you, state law. Perfect, thanks, Bob. <laughs> Aaron. <laughs> So question for staff, uh, I, the idea of the youth ex officio member I think is a really interesting one. Do we need any charter changes or could we just start doing that by policy I mean, since they're non-voting? Yeah, you could do that by policy. You could do it by ordinance. Yeah. Bob. So to follow up on, on that point, um, if um, one way to bring non-residents into the fold would be to have ex officio non-residents. I'm not suggesting that's what we're going to do, but that would be an alternative. In other words, we could do 
no change, we could <coughs> figure out a charter change that would allow non-residents to serve on boards of commissions, or by just simply a council rule, we could create non-resident ex officio positions. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. Jenny. Thank you. I think as um, I think maybe the the split pay thing would impact probably me and Adam the most because being a student, but I don't rely on that. So that's not something that I'm most concerned about. And I think my concern is the having people outside of Boulder on boards. And I know I should be open to that because I believe in diversity and inclusion, but I think it's a hard sell for me. I wonder, can we have maybe, what's the word, a compromise where, because I think you have to live here for one year, can we either lower the amount, let's say the person can live here for three months instead of the whole year. And also I agree with people living in Gun Barrel should have access to boards here in Boulder. Um, but yeah, I would find it very challenging for me to agree with, you don't live here, you, I mean, even though I'm brand new to the community, I did follow the rule and I lived here for at least a year before I ran for council. So I think it would be important for someone to have that community ties in a way, but hey, you can sway me. But for now, I don't necessarily believe that's the right way to go about it. And another thing I would like to know, if that's something that we are going, that's the way we, gonna, we are going, I would want to know clearly what are the benefits and let me know of best practices from other communities where people just walk in and say, I'm joining this board. And we know that, for instance, open space is very important. Can someone just phone their cousin from another city and say, I want you to join open space or housing? So I think to me, I would need to know these things. I know I want inclusion, but I want inclusion done the right way. Thank you. Great, and so I've got Mark and then Mary, and I, I'll just remind us that what we're trying to do is either take things off or give direction to the Charter um, Committee on what we want them to do with these ideas. All right, well, I, I, I share Junie's apprehension about this, but I would have the committee do a little bit of research, show us other communities who've done this, how it's worked, uh, are there limitations on what they have done elsewhere, or, you know, is it open to uh, all committees, just some committees? Uh, you know, we use open space as the example. That to me would be troubling to, to have non-residents be setting policy on open space. I can't off the top of my head come up with other committees that might also trouble me, but I, I, I would have the, the Charter Committee look at those things um, and see what is going on elsewhere. Great, and so I will state that we have already, we've essentially picked the one we want to talk about first, so let's just stick with this while we're doing that and talk about the, what we want the Charter Committee to do, whether it's just drop the idea or, as you talked about, look at best practices for other communities. So let's stick with this one. And then I've got Mary, Adam, Bob, and then Rachel and Aaron. No, that's essentially what I was going to say tonight. We're just trying to figure out whether or not we want to keep this on the table. And if we get a majority of people that don't want to move it forward, um, continue to look into it, that's fine too. So um, that's what this discussion is about. Mm -hmm. uh, Adam? Since I'm on the list, this wasn't the one I was going to talk about, but I'm glad we have a process now. Um, <laughs> process or process. Yes. Uh, I'm fine going ahead with it, kind of finding that middle ground um, that Junie's talking about, because in the current form, I wouldn't support it. Okay, Bob? Yeah, I'm, I'm with, um, with, with Junie and Mark and Adam on, on this. I, I, I'm fine for the committee to study it. Um, I, I, I have a lot of reservations and trepidations for the reasons that Junie stated. Um, I would urge the committee to look at best practices. You know, do other cities have non-residents? Um, if so, do they do as an ex officio non-voting, or are they truly 
non-residents. And then if, if they have non-residents, my question would be how do they, what boundaries do they pick? Is it all of their boards or some of their boards? Is it within the county? How do they, how do they, um, how do they measure nexus? And if we can't find any cities, that probably tells us something as well. Rachel? Um, just pointing out, as, as we all know from reading the packets for tomorrow and the day after, it's just applying to the board. It's not as if we're saying you aren't a resident of this city and you get to be on open space. If it's a concern, we don't have to vote for those individuals that live outside the boundaries. It's really just a way to increase the options. So I, I'm, I'm not very troubled if we set, and I wouldn't limit it to gun barrel. You know, there's a lot of Boulder County that is, is close into Boulder. So if that's a way to improve outcomes for boards, I don't have concerns, and I think that we're not forfeiting our, our right to scrutinize the applications. Aaron. Yes, I, I think the, the concerns raised by Ginny and Bob and Mark and others are, are, are valid. I think it's worth looking into a little bit, but I wouldn't be in a rush on this one, right? Like the Charter Committee tends to, sorry, Rachel, I keep not looking at you because you're, okay. most people are over here. Um, so uh, just trying to be inclusive. So uh, the Charter Committee is often works on things that we then have an intention of putting on the ballot that year and, and moving forward in that kind of time frame. And, and this one, well, you know, maybe let's think about it, let's look at best practices, but I don't, I, I, I know there's concern in the community about this idea, so I don't feel like this is something that we should rush into. Look at it some more, but think about it carefully. Great, and I'll finish this off. I would like a clear articulation of the problem that we're trying to solve with this. So, um, Mary, you've given me an example of a particular um, person who would be very strong on one of our boards who doesn't happen to live here, but she works here. So, I, I just like a, you know, one thing from the Charter Committee to make this even start being something I'd be interested in would be what problem are we trying to solve? And then how is this going to get us there? That would be kind of one question that I would, would have. I'm also in favor of going forward, kind of like Aaron described slowly, and seeing if we can get information from other cities as well as come up with, you know, I wouldn't start with the whole shoot and match. I'd start with one or two well-chosen boards because, you know, when we start talking about planning board and open space, you know, boards with regulatory power having non-residents in them, I think that's going to be a much tougher sell than something where we have trouble filling it and we might, you know, be able to use somebody who works here to fill it, like Boulder Junction, for instance, you know, it would be fine if people who are working in that area would want to be on those boards because we have trouble seating people on those boards anyway. So um, that. Does that kind of sum up where we are, hand it back to the Charter Committee, say don't rush, and say work this one over? Okay, good. And I would suggest process-wise that we handle pay next because I don't think that's super complicated, Bob. Yeah, the only two, th I, th I think this is the intention of the Charter Committee, but let's just be really clear about this. No one is proposing a pay increase. For <laughs> this is, this is, this is, I have. Well, okay. as part of this process, no one's proposing a pay increase for council. This is just a mechanism to change our pay from a per meeting to a per pay period. Um, and and so I just want to be. I know that's your that's the it's position. It's a decoupling. It's a decoupling. Like it. Decoup. Thank you. A decoupling of of per meeting and, and per pay period. The charter can make, can work out whether that's 26 cycles or once a month or whatever. I agree completely. We shouldn't screw up this. We shouldn't try to create a, a different parallel system in the city. We've got 1,400 employees. We should just be nine of those 1,400. And if that's every two weeks, then that's fine. The one thing I would suggest the committee is take a look at the fact. Act, um, and we do this with employees. We have employees come and go, so we have to prorate. We're just going to figure out what, how that proration is going to work because we have people coming on board in November, people leaving in November, uh, and so you just have to figure out that, de that detail on how, how you prorate that. Okay. Payroll systems are good at that. Great. And then I've got Adam and then Rachel. Okay. Uh, my piece on this is I'm fine with whatever the outcome ends up being. I think two weeks is great, even though. Two weeks itself is an antiquated and useless time period for payment, technically, at these days with technology. But um, two weeks is great. Uh, two weeks is, is better than a month for um, people who aren't very well paid because you have bills to pay. And so from an equity standpoint, um, we want to encourage everybody to be able to run for city council. So if we're getting paid once a month at, at this 
abysmally sub sub minimum wage payment, um, it, it's better to do it more frequently, and that's why the the employment law requires you usually to pay every two weeks. So I'm not sure if we're in an exempt class. So I'm concerned about that. Um, and then also, now that we can be on the city's health insurance at an employee rate, like I'm taking city's health insurance and uh, my paycheck doesn't cover it. So it, it, that's part of why it's going to be better to decouple it from the number of meetings and just have it be standard the way that every, <laughs> Adam's giving me a thumbs up. I think we may be the two who are on health insurance. I'm taking it too. Oh, right. Mm -hmm. Three of us. So as, it, as am I. Okay. Sorry. Many, half of us are on health insurance and, and it would be better if we had it, it deducted. And again, that's an equity issue, I think. Yeah, I'm there. I think every two weeks makes perfect sense. Um, I don't know why we would do anything else. Uh, so, you want to disagree? Okay, super. So that's pretty clear instruction. And just to reiterate Bob's point, this is not an increase in pay. Yeah. <laughs> Without raising pay. Darn it. <laughs> so, <laughs> council. Okay, so the next question before us is increase arts commissions and or increase other boards and or give us permission to do that in the future. Aaron? Yeah, well, just I appreciate the charter committee being responsive to the arts commission's request here. I'm, I hear from them that they're really overwhelmed. So I think this is really worth exploring and, and putting on. I think limiting it to arts makes sense. Um, we don't hear about a specific need in any other boards. Um, and then if you give us the authority, you do kind of to raise the number at any time, uh, it does create a kind of court packing opportunity for some future council if they're like, well, some board isn't doing what we want, so we'll just add two members. So I think it's probably best to just do the one. So I'll give that direction. Thumbs up, I've seen lots of thumbs up. Okay, so I think everyone's comfortable with that. So we'll just do the arts. I, I will say I would be comfortable allowing us to make adjustments with very, uh, to other boards, but under very judicious circumstances. So you could only do it at some time relative to an election or something like that, or you would have to take it out. But it's not that important. I think most of our boards are fine where they are. So arts it is, okay. Um, and then the last half issue is ex officio youth. It sounds like we can do that ourselves, so it doesn't really need to come up here because it's not direction to the Charter Committee. Adam, you want to yeah. speak to it? Yeah, I thought it would always, I've had this idea since I started thinking about running for council, but um, having a spot for either high school, college, or grad students specifically that is an ex officio on certain boards that actually most affect them. I think that would be a great idea um, because we have a really hard time putting anyone like that on a board simply because of their circumstances. They're the ones who change, even though a lot of people leave our boards uh, currently before their five-year terms. So um, finding, finding a way to be more inclusive in that sense and finally giving, even if it's not a voting voice, a voice to members of our community who often can't get on boards, I think that would be awesome. Okay, Jeannie. I welcome this idea. I think it's great. And I think it's really inspiring and to give young people the opportunity. I remember I mentioned to Jane as well, when I first got on council, how can we have more youth involvement and whether we can have interns even who serve here on city council because young people are the future, right? And that's just a cliche thing to say, but it's true. So I think that's a great idea, having the one year period. And also we received a few emails last week and there were communities who were members who mentioned that because we, the boards are often four to five years, that could be part of the reason why people are not applying as much. And I'm thinking as well, that's something that we may want to think about when it comes to people who come from disadvantaged backgrounds and when we're thinking of equity and having some lower, uh, lower requirement when it comes to the number of years that people serve. So I think that's a great idea for the young people, 16 to 17 you mentioned, right? And I think as well maybe look into even possibly college students, but of course meeting the the year requirement of being a resident. Thank you. Anyone else? I just strongly support. Yeah, I strongly support it as well. So now there's a process. Oh, sorry, yeah, Mark, I, go ahead. I support it as well, but I'm, I'm a little concerned with how we pick the individuals. Um, 
you know, we need, I think we need to give some thought as to how that, that happens so that it's fair and it doesn't look like uh, a patronage appointment of some kind. Uh, so if we, if we can get um, it fair, I, I think that would be a great idea. Well, although these are going to be non-voting members, is that no, yeah, yeah, clear? Yeah, okay. Yeah. Just the, the, the appointment itself will be significant. It will be significant to the students mm -hmm. and the young people that we put on the boards. And I want to make sure that the process by which we select them um, is far-reaching enough and inclusive enough and fair enough so that uh, nobody's unhappy with the result. Maybe what we could do is um, is have it be in parallel to the, the um, appointment of residents to our board. So in other words, there's an application period in January and February. Maybe they don't have to go through interviews, and then the whole council votes on the on the one or two year appointment of, this, of, the, of the young people. So I have a suggestion that we could consider is um, to have Yoab do the interviewing and okay. the appointing. It's a great okay. idea. Mm -hmm. and just add that we um, discussed that it should probably be on the academic year rather than appointing them at the same time as these. Yeah. Yeah. So, so I would say the question is who do we hand this great idea to to implement it? Do we just hand it to Yoab and say we're willing to do this, work out the details? Oh, that'd be a fine idea. <laughs> Delegate. Okay. <laughs> so so I, we can let Brandon, who's the person that does the liaison with Yoab, we can talk to him about it on the NLC trip and just say council was interested in this. Do you want to take it on? We should not assign it to them. We should just make sure that that that's something that they're interested in. If they are, then we're having a YOAB dinner. In April, I'm not sure which of the dates. In April, so we can talk about it with them, you know, the full larger group, and then if there's excitement, we can just hand it to them and see what they come back with. Mm -hmm. Cool, it, love it. Rachel? Just wondering, Jane, does that sound like the best idea to you? It, it does sound like a good idea. I particularly like the recommendation that it be school year appointments mm -hmm. as opposed to our normal April to March because that will be so hard for them. Um, what, what I would say is that if they want to take it on, certainly they'll work with the city attorney's office to come up with, with or with my office, it's fine, one of us, um, to come up with a procedure and then they can bring it back. So. Yeah. Cool. Anything else regarding the Charter Committee? Um, so I guess the next phase will be, we'll, we know that a couple petitions have been pulled already, right, to gather signatures for initiatives for this year? There's one approved now for okay. circulation. One's approved, and we've heard of a couple that may be coming forward. So going forward, when those come through, we usually have the Charter Committee talk about them. I mean, we're not going to be able to affect them except as we set the titles or whatever. But when is the next meeting of the Charter Committee? April 7th, I think. April 7th. Okay. Good. So you've got our marching orders and then anything else you hear about if it's relevant. I, Go ahead, Adam. Yeah, I just seem to remember, Mary, I thought you were saying something to Tom that we might want to revisit while we were having this discussion way earlier in the meeting. It was on the pandemic um, situation, and should we allow in the charter for the council to meet remotely? We do have a provision in the code, but it probably conflicts with the charter. Okay. That is a really good reminder, Adam. Um, probably that's worth looking at then is I, I, we've decided as a group historically no to call-ins for council members, um, and we've had good reasons for that. But maybe we could set up an emergency provision in the charter that that speaks to conditions under which we'd want to allow that, and they would be pretty emergency, I think. Rachel, well, that sounds great. Um, pandemics seem kind of rare. Like, will that help at all for the coming months, or is there anything we can do to? carry on with business, you know, every, every, we're mapped out well into the future and for the whole year, like we don't want to get behind if we cancel meetings and yet so, so we have them, members of the public are going to feel like they need to be here because that's how it is. You hate to miss a meeting where your issue is well, up. And so I, thanks for raising the issue, Rachel. I mean, if it gets to the point where there's like a really community-wide quarantine, um, we I think maybe take that up. You know, maybe there's something where members of the public 
can do it via video conference. The, the, only the nine of us are here and we sit in opposite corners of the room. Or I, <laughs> I, I don't know, we, but I mean, it, I think you'd kind of need the full quarantine situation before we get there. Well, yeah, I, I don't know. I, I don't know that we're gonna get into full quarantine, but we may get pretty quickly into a situation where the advice is don't go to you know places where members of the public are congregating and you've got people packed into seats there and that's gonna be against the health advice that we're getting. So yeah, I, I don't mind the nine of us. You know, I hate, <laughs> hate to put Jane and Tom and Lynette and Debbie at risk, but, um, and, and will we have a, a way, because right now we, we've suspended the call-in testimony, so I just think those are, you know, we could resume those for sure. And would we need any, to take any action to do that? I think, I think that was a proactive. policy, that was just us. I mean, for, for that piece of it, I don't think we need a charter change. It's for our ability to meet. Junie? Yeah, actually, now you brought this up, I'm very surprised that we don't have any type of contingency plan, emergency contingency plan. I mean, we live in a world, anything can change at any moment, and I think it is important, whether it's for this coronavirus or anything in the future, we should know. And then I understand the charter was created, you know, um, but we have to, you know, move with, the time, so we have to look at what what meetings really mean in times of emergency and how do we do it differently, right? So I think that's very important that we look into that, even whether, you know, tomorrow we hear there's, you know, every, every problem has been solved when it comes to coronavirus, but we definitely need a contingency plan because we are a government and to not have one is very surprising to me. Thank you. So, Tom, what what is in the charter around emergencies? Anything? No, there's no there's no emergency provisions in the charter. Okay. They're all in code. We have a section uh, in the code that deals with emergencies that provides that council can meet outside the city. So it's an ordinance that says that we can meet outside the city. Okay. So maybe charter committee go sort that out. The ordinance is the ordinance in conflict with the charter. If it is, then fix one. It, um, if need be, we can interpret the charter. You get to interpret the charter. You can interpret the charter to say <coughs> it says you have to meet in public. It says that your place of usual meeting. You can construe that in an emergency to be outside the city. I think there's a way to do it, but it would be nicer if there were language in the charter that dealt with emergencies. Yeah, well, I mean, I can imagine, okay, we have this NLC conference coming up, right? <clears throat> there's five of us out of pocket. In fact, we have a quorum in DC. Um, and something really bad happens that needs council action to, to um, vet it. Um, you, so you can imagine we would like some provisions in case something deeply unexpected happens, whether it's sudden or whether it's a virus. I think this is a whole, sounds like. Okay, so you got, oh, I'm sorry. Oh. Go ahead, Aaron. So so then I guess there's the, we can send this to the Charter Committee for work on something for the putting, putting on the ballot, but then we might just charge CAC that, I mean, if, if there really is a recommendation against holding public meetings, but it's not like, a, quarantine level, charge CAC with coming up with creative ways to still conduct our public business while minimizing the risk to the public. Okay, that's a good idea. Um, and as a member of the Charter Committee, um, I feel like I'd say, yes, we need to do something. Tom, what's your advice on, on language? So I wonder, could we ask you now for something to come to the Charter Committee that would help to remedy this and then yeah. we can, no? We can start drafting something. I, it's my, it was my first day at the Charter Committee today. So well, I, so to change the Charter, it has to go to a vote. Right. So no, what it, no yeah. I'm just saying, when we go to meet the next time at the Charter Committee, could can you have some ideas? Can, we, can Tom have already given us some ideas for language that we would need to put to a vote to change the Charter? Rather oh, I see, I see, so for, for, for staff to, to yeah, for staff to come with a proposal yeah. at the next April 7th uh, meeting. Doesn't Kathy Haddock staff that committee? Yes, she does. It. So I'll, I'll work with Kathy. Yeah, already sent it to Kathy. Okay, so does the Charter Committee feel like we've given direction on everything you want? Okay, super. Next. See you south follow up. <laughs> yep. So this was put on at CAC with the intention of Rachel and I sharing with council kind of what the next steps of the process are going to be because staff felt like they got really good direction out of the study session 
And so they're ready to launch a public engagement process leading up to our May 19th meeting, I think. It, yes, I think it is May 19th. Yeah, so on May 19th, we will have the CU South flood issue in front of us again. And because at a study session, we gave staff some direction, but we didn't ratify anything completely, we will figure out between now and then what we need to finally ratify. So there's two elements to it. Uh, there's the technical flood design. So it's going to be, we said, 100 year. Um, and they're going to continue working on that, but they're going to go out to the public and have, we agreed on three public events, one at the end of March, two in April, which the details of what staff is doing are communicated. So how long the wall is, where it ends, where the fill will be, you know, just education about that with one open question, which is what is going to happen with the levy? So the one piece of input I think that staff is going to be looking for from boards, so there will be open space, RAB, and planning will be the three boards that um, staff is going to go to, as well as these three public events. And so the, um, the, the point of this uh, update is not just to tell you about the process, but there's going to be an ask for council members as well. So we've got the process going to May the flood wall and technical flood details, and then annexation. So annexation won't have a decision point in May. Annexation is going to be an ongoing process, but it seems like a time to ask the community how they see the transition from guiding principles going into the annexation agreement. Like what do the public want to see as far as the clarity of what we'll know going into the annexation. So in May, that won't be decided. In May, we might make a pretty strong decision on the technical flood design um, and the levy as part of that. So what, what staff offered, both Public Works and Open Space, was if you members of council have specific things that you're hopeful <coughs> that staff will do work on, so an example is upstream options. You know, if a council member wants to hear about the history of upstream options, you can say, staff, you know, we'd like to make sure that you assemble a coherent package. And I think they will for Open Space Board of Trustees anyway. But there's a whole list of things like this that Open Space has asked for and that council may want to know about. For me, the levy is one. For instance, you know, what, how much will it take to take it down? What will the cost be? You know, what are the habitat implications of that? That's just an example. So I will be asking about, you know, what are the potential upside habitat impacts to getting rid of the levy? So if you want staff work done before May to help you answer some questions and you think that will also be useful for the public, the sooner you can get that on the table, the better. Um, rather than just bringing it up at the May meeting. And some of that, I, I, or maybe all of it, I assume, requires an out of five if we want staff to bring us information. Like, I, I, it I, depends on how big it is, right? So, I mean, I forget what your, it's a couple hours is your... That's right. So I think we can put it out there and on hotline. and. If staff says this is going to be 10 hours worth of work, bring that information back to us so we can do a nod. Okay. But I think some of it won't necessarily be. Okay. Just wanted to clarify because um, I had made an ask and, and it had to come for an out of five. Um, and then another um, point is just part of what we're trying to, to tee up for the public engagement is what questions do they want to weigh in on during annexation? So what is it that um, is going to be important to them that, you know, so we, we can't really ask them to weigh in at this point, but what do they want us to be thinking about? So in terms of like fields and roads and, and what the public benefits are going to be there. Yeah, and I think, you know, there was some back and forth on this at the process subcommittee, and we decided to go ahead and do annexation now because if you get too far down the road and things are locked in and you haven't done your public outreach ahead of time, then you end up in a situation where you're accused of not having 
you know, been transparent or upfront. So the goal of, of asking about annexation here was just to make sure that the public was being brought along with what we're doing and thinking. So I want to be clear on, on what the process is looking like here. So you're saying that at these public outreach and at the boards, to ask also about, as, as Aaron put it, the bridge between um, the guiding principles and annexation. Mm -hmm. So that so that there's public input being gathered at those points. Yeah, and, and it may not be all boards, you know, that right. they, they'll care about different things relative to the annexation probably, but for the public outreach events to make sure that they have the opportunity to tell us what's important about the bridge. And then at the study session, it, that's what we're going to have in May, right? No, it's a no. it's a public meeting. It's a public. It's a public it's hearing. It's a public hearing. Okay, what if we had a study session in there somewhere so that um, because where we would talk about the input that's been gathered from the public, and then we have a study session and we talk about it so that when we have the public hearing, there's a little more information to the public about what is out there instead of doing it all at the public hearing? So my understanding is that the public hearing, our decisions will be mostly around flood control. And so I like your idea of a study session, but I think maybe downstream of that May meeting. No pun intended. <laughs> Careful. Watch the water analogy. At least he didn't say And, and yeah. I would also add, I know, uh, <laughs> that our, our timing is so condensed here, like we're not going to finish the public sessions, I think, um, I think we're calling them road shows until maybe late April. Mid late, yeah. And so to give staff time to, to you know, a lot of it's going to be like open-ended questions. What do you care about during annexation? And so they've got to compile all that. And I think it would be, given that that's just going to be like three weeks before um, our public hearing, I think staff was already worried about having it ready for that. So I don't think we could really fit a study session in there. Yeah. And, and I think we have time, you know, I don't, uh, for annexation to do a study session later. Yeah. Okay. That was all that was on this, was just a little process. Does anybody have any questions or comments? Okay, super. Council Agenda Committee time change. Jane? Yeah, thank you. Um, at the retreat, it was brought up that um, CAC would like us to consider moving the CAC meeting, which is 8 a.m. on Mondays, to a later time on Mondays, close to being after work. So we did a staff poll of the department directors and those who would normally attend CAC um, and asked them three choices. They didn't have a choice of not to move it because I think that would have been their favorite, but um, <laughs> their Just choices saying. were 4.30, 5 or 5.30, and 100% of the survey participants chose 4.30 as the preferred time. The themes that came out about their thoughts about it. We, we just asked them any concerns they might have. Is the people have personal commitments, in particular child care, that is very important for them to leave at a particular time to make sure that they can get their kids from child care, as well as other family obligations that they might have, soccer practice, band concerts, whatever it might be. Um, there were people expressed concerns to workflow because what, the way that we actually operate right now is that we have the meeting at 8 a.m. and things often change with regard to upcoming meetings. And at 10 a.m. we have a staff agenda meeting and go over upcoming agendas and tell people that, oh, this one moved, this one came off, they're asking these particular questions, and they're worried that there won't be enough time to change or answer questions 
between essentially five o'clock at night and six o'clock the next evening. So they're just worry about will we be able to meet your expectations in providing correct information. And then others raise the idea that the, the tab meets on Mondays once a month and having a late CAC meeting could impact the transportation folks. Um, so those are pretty much the main concerns that were expressed. Um, I've, 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 I've lost the plot a little bit. I can't, I can't remember what was the driver for moving to, to, does anybody remember what the driver was to move into the evening was? Well, well I mean, it, it's just a rough start to, not just because it's early, but, you know, the earliest I can be in at work is 9.30, and it, it just, oh, okay. you know, there was for those of us that work full time, it was just a question of this is more difficult to accommodate than it would be. Thanks. At the end, how, how would people feel about? Uh, so thanks for that. I've, I've gotten the idea. The reason, um, how would people feel about the lunch hour on Monday? So that might accommodate work schedules, but then also address the concerns that staff raised. Um, you lose a half day, but you don't lose a whole day. Uh, I don't know if that's better, Jane. Then, so we didn't ask that, mm -hmm. um, and it's up to you. I, uh, my problem, I guess I'll say, with lunch hour is that it's really difficult for you to drag yourselves away from your work, show up here at noon. Now you're going to have to leave work early, supposedly come here at noon, have CAC, and then get yourself back to work. So it's it's still going to take. It's more disruptive, I yeah, think. I just, yeah, I just it's, was trying to be yeah. that. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So... Mm -hmm. I don't see a big difference between starting at 8 and getting to work at 9.30 and starting work at 8 and leaving at 4, four to get here at 4.30. So it, it doesn't seem like it's making um, a big difference in terms of the workday. And um, I, it seems a lot more disruptive in terms of what kind of information can be provided for council the next day? Because oftentimes at, at CACs we'll ask for, uh, we'll ask questions and, um, and then staff goes off and does it. And oftentimes gets it to, it to us prior to the council meeting. And this would do away with the full eight hours of being able to answer those questions. So I have that concern. Um, I also, um, the CAC minutes, you know, they arrive at about, I don't know, in the afternoon sometime on Monday, so you're able to read them and catch up and see what's, what's changed in the agenda. Oftentimes on Tuesdays, I find myself not able to read all the email that's arriving in, in Tuesday afternoon. So I probably wouldn't even, you know, we may not get a chance to even look at the CAC minutes. So, it, moving it, it doesn't seem like it makes a big difference in the workday, um, and um, it just seems like it would provide less quality information with very little time um, by squeezing the time that they can research issues in. Rachel? Um, did we talk about Friday afternoon instead of Monday afternoon for this? Mm-mm. No, don't, don't, don't. <laughs> I mean, our lives are already happy sort of hour. sunk, like, right, we, maybe that we may, do it, do it's it. a happy hour. Um, right. it's happy hour. Well, I'm, I'm just saying, like, that, that uh, it's, it's 4 or 4.30 on a Friday rather than Monday afternoon, so staff can, I don't know how much they're working on it over the weekend, though, um, but, Yes, right. no. they're, yeah, I'm sorry, they're not working on it over the weekend. They're not supposed to be working and? on the weekend. <clears throat> Excuse me. And just truly, a lot of people do take off early on Fridays, and that would, would limit their ability to do that. Adam. <laughs> so as someone currently serving on CAC, I agree with Mary that it doesn't personally buy me that much more time um, moving it to 4.30 in the afternoon, and it sounds like the current um, benefits 
don't outweigh, or sorry, the, the future benefits don't outweigh the current negative. So um, what I would say is though, maybe this is something we can address if we ever go to the Thursday thing. That's what I was. Yep. Yeah. I can, yeah. Because yeah, I was I was going to go there as well. I'm per personally as a as a morning um, as not a morning person as a as very much not a morning person who who also has a lot of people I work with on the East Coast. I hate Monday morning CACs, but that's kind of me personally. So I get the impacts of the staff situation. If we were able to find a way to work with council member <coughs> schedules and do Thursday meetings instead of Tuesday ones, it becomes more doable. Absolutely. I know that's not doable this year. Jenny. I wanted to go back to why we were moving, and I think it was it had to do with whether it's one or two city ca council persons um, schedule issue. And I was wondering, can it be, what's the word, temporary? If that would help solve the problem as well. Because for now, my time is not until December. And I had already put it on my, in my mind that we were gonna meet on Monday at eight in the morning. But I'm okay with the change because I will be able to fix my schedule by December. But I'm wondering, can it be something temporary rather than something permanent? So I was one of the proponents of this idea. Um, I, and I'm like Aaron, it's not so much that I'm not a morning person, I just don't like the way that, um, it starts the week late. Yeah. Like I'm coming in really getting able to be organized at 10 in the morning on Monday and it, it kind of puts me behind um, and it takes a little while to catch up. And then if we have a late Tuesday meeting, goodness. Um, but the advantage to the time change was really when combined with Aaron's day change. So, you know, doing a Monday afternoon, and I was thinking 5 or 5.30, to be quite frank. I mean, I don't know, I understand there are impacts to staff, but, you know, Tuesday nights, we're keeping people here till all hours of the night. So I, did, I was figuring people could schedule it. So I'm willing to let this drop. But I, I, I also think that, you know, it should be recognized it's suboptimal for the council people, some of them who have to serve on this. So um, we'll, I'm fine t taking it off the list, but I think in the future, having a Monday or Tuesday afternoon CAC for a Thursday council meeting would be a great way to go. I've got Mark and then Junie. I think if you package the two of them together, <coughs> you've got a system that might work rather well, giving staff a little more time to respond to CAC, um, not having the, the beastly eight o'clock Monday uh, start to the week, um, and a Thursday meeting. If you package those together, I think you might have something that uh, uh, we could support. Jenny. I think I wanted to go back. We've talked about this many times, how we check each other, and we mentioned the Tipton report, is that we have to be mindful what will work best for staff, because at the end of the day, we're all working in this organization together, and we have to ensure that we support one another. So I think if, Jane, after you've talked with a lot of your staff and they would agree that 8.30 is the best time and you're willing to drop it as you mentioned, I think we should be a best example because right now we are striving to put our best foot forward in the community and we have to show that through leadership and if we have to wake up a slightly a little bit early to show staff that we support them, we should do it. Adam. Last thing I'll say. Um, I think we could solve a lot of this and additional issues if we look into making council a full-time job with full-time pay. <laughs> Shudder. <laughs> okay, on that note, nope. does any, I think we're done with that subject. Does anyone have any debrief or other issues they want to bring up? Okay, one of the later meetings so far, 1021. Still 39 minutes early. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. <laughs> Fascinating. What did we give too much time to? We gave too much time to the cop.